uh, we now to go to Councillor uh, Robert Irvine. Thanks very much, Chair Hart. I uh, just had problems getting in there, so I literally squeezed in. Uh, two apologies, uh, Councillor Matthew Bale and Councillor Alan Rainey. And okay. Councillor Bert Wilson, I'm just not sure, depending on the silage. Thank you. Well, Bert's in at the moment, so he is, so thank oh, you. Oh, that's all right then. I'll not apologise for him. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Robinson, behalf of DUP. Uh, I think Councillor Eskin is not coming. I don't see her on the screen. She wasn't in last night, so I put an apology oh. for her. Okay, thank you, Councillor Robinson. Uh, Councillor Garrity, behalf of the SDLP. Thanks very much, Chair. I'm hard. We have apologies tonight from Councillor Adam Gannon. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mary. And now, is there any apologies from uh, single member parties or independents? Chair, I believe uh, Councillor O'Coffey is running slightly late. He had a family issue, so he's hoping to be here in the next half hour or so. Okay, thank you, Councillor McAleer. Okay, so that's our ap apologies. Uh, we now, uh, I have signed the minutes of, of the previous meeting, that's item two. And we now go on to item three, which is declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest for tonight's meeting? Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. Good evening. Yes, as a member of the Fermanonoma Health and Social Care Services Subcommittee, um, item 5.6. Okay, 5.6. Anybody else wishes to declare an interest at this stage? Councillor Warrington. Well, obviously 5.6 as well, uh, uh, but I, I don't know if it's uh, a case where we have to remain silent. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I'm getting a nod to that effect, so I think we're okay there. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Councillor Thompson? Uh, 5.6, Chair. Okay, Councillor Coyle? Uh, Five point six chair um, on the Roman okay. on behalf of the Social Care Board. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor McCann. Yes, um, same again, chair. Just as a member of that group. Okay. Thank you, and that's all I'm uh, seeing uh, with hands up. So, Councillor McCann, thank you. Right. Well, the next thing on the agenda is item four. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't see Councillor Council Curry. Sorry, I didn't see your hand there. No, apologies, Chair. I was late coming in um, putting my hand up there. Just 6.6, .6, just as the Council's rep on the NFLA, since it's around an invoice, Chair, just to declare that interest. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Curry. You. So we're moved on now to uh, item four, and that's matters arising. And that's matters arising from the Policy and Resources Committee on Thursday, the 8th of July. It, uh, and we go through, uh, we have been through for accuracy, so we're looking for matters arising. I go through page by page. Page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten, page eleven. Page 12, page 13, bring in Alison at this stage. Thanks, Chair. Just in relation to item 831 on page 13, members will have seen correspondence for NILGA, uh, which we've been asked to bring to your attention regarding the dissolution of the Commission. This was a, a matter the Council or the Committee considered at its last meeting, Chair, and uh, we then have subsequent correspondence um, on the regional negotiating framework and the associated machinery uh, just over the page uh, on item 8.32. So in all cases, Chair, those items are just for noting. Okay, so we'll take them all together. Let's have a proposer to note. Uh, Councillor McCann and seconder, uh, Councillor Robinson. Okay, we're now on to a... Uh, Page 14, page 15, page 16, page 17, page 18, 
page 19, page 20. Do you think, Alison? Department Secretary, of Community. Yes, just a, item 11, 9, Chair, the response from the, the Department for Communities in relation to the Council's correspondence on the PIP assessment process. Okay, can I have a proposer to note? Uh, Councillor McPhillips and seconded by Councillor Warrington. Uh, all agreed? Okay, that's passed. And we've moved on now to page 21 and page 22. Okay, that's the matters arising dealt with. We now move on to item five, which is Chief Executive Directorate reports, and these are for decision. Uh, the first one is 5.1, to consider draft response to the DERA committee call for evidence on climate change, number two bill, and it's listed as paper A. Uh, I think Margaret, uh, if you could more or less take us through that, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. The um, purpose of this report is to seek members' approval for the draft response. The ERA, the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, call for evidence on the Climate Change Number 2 Bill. Minister for DERA has developed a bill, um, which is now referred to as Climate Change Number 2 Bill, and it was introduced to the Assembly in July 21, and it's anticipated that it will be referred to the Committee for Scrutiny in September 21. Uh, the attached draft response is supportive of the introduction of climate change legislation and reflects the views previously expressed by elected members. It advocates for a net target by 24 vision of climate action plans, just transition principles, sectoral targets, the establishment of an independent climate commissioner and office, and also advises that the CCC, uh, the, uh, sorry, the Climate Change Commission should not be relied upon as the sole advisory body. We have today, though, um, received some additional points, um, which um, I, I'll just read to you. Um, one is relation to the bill's objectives, where um, we've received comment that the 82% increase is achievable by 2050. Um, the Climate Change Committee, quote, setting emissions reduction targets that are too ambitious can undermine credibility. Um, dates and targets could and should be adjusted and reach the Council's preferred option of zero emissions in the district by 2042. Um, as technologies advance, the timescales should be reviewed at least every five years. In terms of emissions targets, um, the UK and Northern Ireland has a CO2 rate of 6.8 tonnes. Um, but this must be weighed against the agri-food sector producing 20% of the UK's beef and 15% of the UK's milk production. Any food brought in to replace those reductions in production will have a massive carbon footprint. In relation to carbon budgets, um, to allow businesses to set financial budgets five in every five years seems to be a sensible time frame. Um, and protections must be put in place to prevent industries outside agriculture purchasing land um, and planting trees to achieve net zero within their industries. Carbon transfer should be retained within agriculture until the agri-food industry achieves net zero. Um, resource implications, given that Northern Ireland is one of the highest carbon footprints in the UK, remuneration must reflect the size of the reduction required. And the division of resources must reflect amount resources required to implement and, and the research and new technology required. Um, and then in terms of transboundary, making the point that the standards of food production in Northern Ireland are excellent. And the last thing we want to do is import goods from elsewhere. Not only is the safety and welfare standard lower, but the carbon footprint is much higher. There must be tighter controls on the carbon footprint of all products entering the UK. So, um, if members wish to include those comments, um, is a matter of members. Uh, the recommendation of the report is that the council approves the draft response in relation to the call for evidence and views on the climate change number two bill. Okay, thank you, Margaret. A uh, the speakers here. The first one is Councillor Bert Wilson.
Councillor Wilson, can you hear me? Yes, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, I can, yes. Go on ahead, Bert. Bert, can, can you speak, please? Councillor Wilson, we'll have to bring you in later. Uh, you're muted at the moment. Uh, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, start out by saying that I, I welcome the response from, from Council. Uh, you know, it, it notes several points that the North is the, the only local jurisdiction without a binding greenhouse gas reductions targets. Um, the other locations all have had climate legislation in place for a number of years and have all recently amended that legislation to show more ambition and reflecting the urgency of the climate crisis and the need to do more. As highlighted, the, the caveat in this bill of at least 82% doesn't represent the strongest possible ambition that is demonstrated in other jurisdictions globally or in the rest of, of Britain and down south. And I think that the at least terminology does not set the ambition and will not drive ambition. Net zero based on the most up-to-date science is the only standard that, that is acceptable. Uh, as referenced there, I think in, in Margaret, the amendments that Margaret had mentioned and, and I think in the, the report as well, five-year targets rather than 10-year targets are necessary and annual carbon budgets and sectoral carbon budgets must also be devised. Climate action plans are necessary to establish how we get to a net zero target. And I have to say, I'd also support the setting up of an independent climate commissioner and a climate office so that there can be independent scrutiny of progress on climate targets and review of implementation in the legislation. Um, and, and as noted there, in addition to the, the CCC, advice should also be sought from the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change and down south on the Climate Advisory Council. So I would commend the the officers involved in the response and thank them for it. And I'm um, happy enough to propose noting. I don't think there was anything uh, too different or too, too off what has been included in those amendments. So I think the including them shouldn't be an issue as well. So happy enough to propose the note in that, Chair. So just to get this right, you're happy to propose acceptance with the amendments that our, uh, Margaret has outlined. Is that right? I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that seems right enough, yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Wilson, can you hear me now? You're muted. Next uh, speaker then is uh, Councillor Siobhan Curry. For Margaret Carley, um, I wouldn't be happy now to support the amendments there, not as I have heard them. Um, I just want to congratulate though Margaret um, and the team just for the report that the response that has been put together. I would be happy with that proposal. Um, I think it sets out um, the issues very well. Um, the DARA bill sets an overall target of at least an 82% reduction um, in greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050 and then their interim targets. It's deeply unambitious and it is the bare minimum that's already legally required. So that totally plays in the face of the latest IPPC report. And that warned that we're not doing enough quickly enough to reach the temperature limitations set out in the Paris Accord. Um, and I think that's been covered well in the council response. I think there needs to be um, a, a, any bill has to legislate for a net zero uh, greenhouse gas emission. Just on the amendments, um, and as well, I think this is covered. Um, the bill gives the department the power to amend both the target dates and target percentages. It doesn't specify whether those can go up or down, um, but it does name some requirements that must be met for amendments to be made, including seeking advice from the CCC. Not good enough. Um, targets have to be set and have to be adhered to, and if they are reviewed, it should only be possible to bring them in. Um, that is to bring uh, forward the date or move the target closer to net zero. Again, I think this has been covered well um, by our council team. Um, just to reiterate the comments around um, the oversight, which I think the council team makes as well, um, that we want to see the creation of an independent climate office and climate commissioner. 
to ensure that all departments are working towards um, and achieving the targets. The council does mention just transition, but I don't see it named as such. Um, the DARA bill doesn't contain any mention of a just transition, nor does it provide for the creation of a just transition commission and any bill that isn't based upon just transition principles uh, will, will fail. Um, and just on the, uh, they touch on it um, very <laughs> briefly on the transboundary. The DARA bill contains no all Ireland elements whatsoever. The fact that we live on an island, uh, we share a unique climate, we have a unique biodiversity um, we are environment, economy, industries, particularly agri-food, are all intertwined. So it is really astonishing that a bill proposing to tackle climate change wouldn't acknowledge this physical reality and wouldn't make any um, kind of efforts to coordinate our approach um, to the climate and biodiversity's uh, biodiversity crisis with the rest of the island. I just would like that to be strengthened a little bit more, but I appreciate okay, it's okay, there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, just just to summarise, what what you're doing is proposing, uh, as uh, Margaret has it, in in the, the the current paper without the amendments, but a slight amendment with regard to the All Ireland. Is that right? Just to strengthen that, it is there, Chair, but just okay. to strengthen it a little. Um, it's just that, if I could, Chair, just the amendments that Margaret outlined there seem to me to be to be at odds actually with the council response maybe that's just the way i've taken it but it's okay okay councillor wilson can you come in at this stage chair can you hear me yes i can if you just yep. stay that way uh, we can uh, well that's, hear you. that's fine um to start with uh, obviously it says that some of these targets can be uh, altered at any time they're suitable and that uh, they are at the, at the minute uh, pretty uh, severe and uh, to say that they can alter them at any t time, I think that, that should not be in the bill. Um, other countries, uh, you know, if we were getting treated as uh, the mass of the world is being treated, well, that's fair enough. But we are being picked out here as guinea pigs. Uh, Brazil and uh, China, well, China especially is 25% of the uh, emissions that are being created, yet we will end up buying our food when we put our uh, industry uh, out of business. We will end up shipping it in and putting uh, uh, food miles uh, that uh, are totally unnecessary. Uh, as well as that, this will put somewhere in the region of 13,000 jobs, uh, agricultural jobs, uh, out of business. Uh, the uh, the income for uh, beef will be down from 583 million to 210 million, dairy in from 748 million to 252 million, sheep from 113 million to 50 million, poultry down by 16 percent, and a reduction in our stock uh, over the years by 86 percent. So if you own 100, man, uh, 100 animals, you will end up with 16. Uh, as well as that, we were uh, over the years, uh, DARD or DERA, whatever that, that time was, uh, encouraged farmers to spend money on making houses more comfortable for stock uh, and all the rest. And that was quite uh, right. But uh, most farmers ended up with uh, 10, 20 year uh, borrowing loans from banks or finance companies to do all this to uh, keep everybody happy. And they still have that ahead of them, yet they will have no uh, stock uh, or uh, it, it will be hobby farming. It will not be an industry anymore. And uh, I would uh, clearly uh, not agree with anything that's in that or very little of it anyway. The okay. council even there, the, uh, the impact on the financial resources of the council's estates they have no idea as to what uh, that is uh, coming to. Uh, the f uh, general finance from the council itself is debatable. Uh, there's so no, uh, I'm going to ask you to come yes. to a close shortly. Have you any proposals yes. or well, seconds at this stage? Well, I, I would propose that uh, th this uh, bill, uh, we represent uh, uh, farmers in this area. A lot of the industry is uh, to do with farming 
I'm going to have to call we, you we, we, Yes, I propose that we, or I uh, propose that we reject this, uh, propose, uh, most of the proposals and revisit them again because they're, as, they, as they stand, they are not uh, suitable okay, for that's, that's, that's Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I have seen a, a message uh, from Councillor Michael Lear. I'm going to ask, I'll, I'll let John, uh, Councillor McLaughlin in next and then come back to Councillor Michael Lear. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, obviously, uh, Bert, Bert's coming from this at, at a, an agriculture and he has quoted some of the, the KPMG stuff that I was going to quote. So I'm not going to use that. Uh, as part of the UK, our net tonnage is 6.8. Northern Ireland standalone is 11.3. The Republic, 13.3 tonnes of, of carbon uh, per person per year. It's uh, we, we were going to have to adjust. However, our agri industry produces 20% of the UK's beef and 15% of the UK's milk. So obviously we would be looking some net mitigation coming back from the UK to, to help offset part of that against our agriculture. And there's also some safeguards in there to uh, to protect the farmers that, uh, that all their carbon credits remain within the industry until it doesn't reach net zero. We're never going to get a perfect world but we're going to have to adjust it. Everybody wants to turn the switch off straight away, but the most important thing is getting climate change controls started. Once we get it started, then we can adjust it as we go along and, and hope to reach it. So I'm happy to second Councillor McAleer's proposal that we go with the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the reply with the, uh, the changes that are suggested. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor McLaughlin. I'll come back now to a uh, Councillor McAleer. Sorry, Chair. Um, the the beauty of having these meetings live streamed, I could listen back to the the original or the proposal with the amendments. So okay, I, if you could it, make it short, because this is yeah, second time it, in. Some of it is sensible. Some of it, I think, is uh, Councillor Corey is actually quite right in what she's saying. So I, I couldn't support all the amendments listed. So with that in mind, I would propose or at this stage second the, the proposals from Councillor Corey, I think, going ahead. So you're second, Councillor Corey, is that right? And withdrawing correct, your... Yeah. Okay, so what we have at the moment is... Uh, Councillor Curry, uh, seconded by yourself, and we have a proposal to well, revisit. Well, I'm proposing that, Chair, if I, for speaking over you. Uh, I want to propose that with the amendments. Okay, and uh, so it looks like we have three different proposals. Councillor Wilson wants a revisit. So I, I will only take two proposals with a seconder at a time. So uh, Councillor Coyle was in next, I think. Chair, on a point of order, just yes. do you not be considering the proposal that has been seconded first? Just, just, I'm just not sure. Okay, just check with Alison here. Hold on, please. I'm, I'm being told that uh, it's the discretion of the chair. Really, we have a proposal that's seconded, and we have another a uh, proposal. But I'm looking uh, if there's a second, a seconder for the second proposal. I uh, will then I'll I'll take that and we'll do a vote. Uh, next one in, uh, Councillor Baird appears to be next in. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the frog got my throat there. Look, um, the the introduction of net zero by 2050 or even more worse 2042 would create northern ireland to be a sacrificial lamb within the food industry uh, the, the farming community the food industry uh, it would all go down the drain uh, some uh, targets might be achieved but that would be offset by other countries coming in not adhering to the rules uh, i certainly can't uh, accept that zero target 
And I would like to make it clear the Nilga position on this. Nilga has set it out quite clearly. Um, net emissions will be at least 80% lower by 2050, 69% lower by 2040, and 48% lower by 2030. So I think that has to be taken into account what the, the Nilga position is. My colleague uh, John McCloughery has made that proposal that uh, includes that, so I will second his proposal. Okay, uh, we have now a second proposal, so uh, are there others wish to okay. for, for comments? Chair. 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 Councillor Wilson, yes. Yes, I, 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 I will withdraw my proposal in favour of okay. uh, Councillor McLaughlin. Okay, okay. Uh, we have two different proposals. So I'm going to take the first proposal, which is Councillor Curry proposal, and it's seconded by Councillor Michael Lear. And that is to take the uh, Margaret's uh, response as is with a little strengthening uh, to the, the cross Ireland position. Uh, all those, uh, Councillor Rainey, could you take your hand down, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, all those in favour of that proposal. If they could put their hands up, please, and keep them up. Please keep them up the way we can make a, a, a good count here. Chair. I'm getting 19 here. A Chair. different from that. Chair, Councillor Clark here. I can't. Oh, sorry, Councillor Clark. I, I didn't realise that you were in. I'm, I'm for this too, but I can't for some reason raise the hand on it. So. Okay, you're you're uh, a you calling user. I hadn't seen you in, but you obviously no, are. No, I'm, no, I'm on. I'm on iPad the <laughs> Okay. All right. But I, I, I can't seem yes, to raise sir. the hand. Councillor Thornton, I couldn't get my hand up either, but I do now, so I need to be counted in. Thank you. Hold on, we'll just, uh, if you could keep your hands up, please, and we'll recount this. I'm being told it doesn't work here properly, so I will have to go through a rule call. I'm sorry about that. It 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 has moved a couple of times there, so I'm going to go for a rule call here. And first of all, Councillor Diane Armstrong. Against. Okay, I've got the wrong sheet here. Okay, thank you. Against. Hey, uh, Councillor Baird. Against. Uh, Councillor Bell is not here. Councillor Blake? Four, Chair. Four. Councillor Buchanan? Against, Chair. Against. Uh, Councillor Glenn Campbell? Over four, Chair. Okay. Councillor Sean Clark? Four. Four, okay. Councillor John Coyle? Four. Okay. Councillor Siobhan Curry? Evaber, four. Four. Councillor Josephine Deacon. Four, Chair. Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Evaber, four. Councillor Sean Donnelly. Four. Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Four, Chair. Four. Councillor Keith Elliott. Against. Councillor Deborah Erskine. Is she present? Apology. Councillor Anthony Feely. Four. Councillor Anne Marie Fitzgerald. Not present. Councillor Adam Gannon. Not present. Councillor Mary Garty. Four, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Seamus Green. Four. Councillor Robert Irvine. 
Against? Councillor Eamon Keenan. For. Councillor Catherine Kelly. For, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Padrigan Kelly. I'll come back to Padrigan. Not on. Okay. Councillor Tommy Maguire. The hay for. Okay. Councillor Evan McAleer. For. Councillor Chris McCaffrey. The hay for. Councillor Stephen McCann. For. Councillor John McLaughry. Against. Councillor no, Barry Michael Duff is not present. Uh, Councillor Gavin McPhillips. For, Chair. Councillor Donald Coffey. Not on yet. Councillor Thomas O'Reilly. For. Councillor Alan Rainey. Against. Against. Councillor Paul Robinson. Against. Councillor Bernie Swift. For. Councillor Earl Thompson. Against. A uh, Councillor Howard Thornton, myself. Against. Councillor Victor Warrington. Against. Councillor Bert Wilson. Against. Okay, thank you. We'll just check those numbers now. Uh, sorry, Chair. I, I see Councillor Podrigan Kelly is on our list. Uh, you feel to go Sorry, back is pa and sorry. If I could also apologise for Councillor Anne Marie Fitzgerald, I omitted that at the start of the meeting, Chair. Oh, no, no, no problem. Oh, no. Councillor Podrigan Kelly, sorry, I'd come back to you. Councillor Padrigan Kelly. I'm getting no response there, Councillor McGuire. All right. No. Heard. Hey. We have counted that uh, three of us here, and it's uh, 21 for and 12 against. So the motion, uh, the recommendation is, is carried. No, what do you mean to vote tonight? It's about night there again. No. Sorry. Okay. 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 Councillor Sean Donnelly, do you, do you wish to speak? Yeah, sorry, I had a great there for a few seconds, and the motion made another vote. So when he came out of his own throw, uh, I'm for. Okay, well, it has passed there anyhow, Councillor Donnelly. Sorry about that. Sorry, I'm being told that you did vote and it was counted. There was only one vote. Well, I said there and he came in and just had to leave it. Okay, well, we, we have counted you in, so it's already within the 21. Well, okay, thank you, Councillor Donnelly. Chair? Uh, Councillor Wilson, yes. Yes, but I wanted noted and uh, plainly noted that mm -hmm. I am totally against okay. uh, the okay. proposal that has been carried tonight. Okay. It will be a disaster for okay. the, okay. For the farmers Wilson. that we represent. Thank you. You've made your comments. Okay, we're moving on. Okay, members, that's uh, item uh, 5.1, 5.2, and this is to consider draft response right on that yeah is the northern ireland housing executives draft rural strategy 2021 to 2025 and that is paper b and again a call on margaret please thank you chair um the purpose of this report margaret, is to you, seek you're members very, approval for the could you speak up a little bit margaret please you're hard to pick up sorry chair the purpose of this report is to seek members' approval for the draft response to the public consultation on the Northern Ireland Housing Executive's draft rural strategy. Um, the document contains three cross-cutting themes, supporting rural customers, enabling the provision of affordable rural homes, and securing the future of our rural communities. Um, the draft response provides commentary on these three themes, as well as other issues. Um, in drafting the response, we had discussions with several key stakeholders, including housing executive officials and housing association representatives. Um, one of our team also attended a workshop organized by the housing executive. 
some of the issues contained within the draft response include uh, the need uh, to, re to recognize future housing need, taking into account issues like the aging population, impacts for, un people, for young people, consistent unmet housing need within the district, social housing waiting lists for rural areas, rural development and new build targets, <laughs> excuse me, housing affordability and availability, social housing need, but particularly in rural areas, and future proofing in relation to both sustainability and climate change. So the recommendation of the report is that the council approves the draft response to the public consultation on the draft rural strategy, reaching rural. Sorry, I was muted there. The first one to speak then is uh, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Margaret, for bringing this report. It, it, it is really excellent. It covers um, all the areas that um, need to be addressed. Um, there's one question I have, Margaret, is bearing in mind a paper we considered last night, the Area Integrated Partnership Boards, and delivering care within the community as far as possible to support people to manage their multiple and or long-term conditions. I'm just thinking of the impact that will have um, with more people um, living at home, managing their health conditions. So again, I think is that something that needs to be referenced within the report? Um, I, I just maybe um, like your response on that, but otherwise I'm happy to 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 propose uh, the report. Margaret, and thank you for that. Okay, uh, Margaret, do you want to comment on that, please? Certainly, Chair. Um, yes, we can certainly include that within the report. That's not a problem. Okay, thank you. Thank Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly, next to speak. Thank you, Chair and Margaret. Thank you for the response. It's very comprehensive. I mean, I'm, I'm on the Rural Affairs Committee, and the rural issues come up all the time in terms of identifying the difficulty for people to remain in the rural areas where they grow up in. And I think this goes a long way to uh, target that. I wonder, Margaret, would it be could you maybe include something about the need maybe for departments to work together? I'm thinking of the Department of Infrastructure because particularly in my own area in Drumquin, you know, the wastewater treatment is making it very difficult for new houses to be built because of the lack of capacity in the system. So while we need to address, yes, the rural strategy with the Northern Ireland Housing Executive, they have to look at things on a, as a whole. It's not just one department's role. I think there's a need for investment to encourage, you know, housing uh, to address the housing needs in the rural communities. But I'm happy to second the proposal with the recommendation. Thank you. Okay. I think I'll go to the other speakers before I come back to Margaret. Uh, Councillor Emin Keenan. Uh, thank you, Jerry. I was going to say the same as Councillor Donnelly there, but. Uh... The water treatments, the same down here. We got the report for Newtown Butler, I think Brook Brook Maguire's Bridge, the same. So you need to tie in all together. And then with the recent announcement from DFA about the rural planning going to be changing, you know, is it going to be possible to build in rural areas? Um, I suppose what we would like to see is a commitment to actually build houses. I think it's 50 years in this and Skeef, since it was last a major um, housing development by the housing agency. So long overdue. So I won't hold my breath. But... Okay, thank you, Councillor Keenan. Uh, Councillor John Coyle. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Margaret for a comprehensive uh, consultation response. Um, I just have an issue, like this rural strategy, um, you know, the proposal that DFC had announced, uh, Karen McKillen was the minister stepping in for Minister Hargey at the time. Uh, around uh, building social housing and that the you know the splitting of the housing executive, but that funding I believed was going to be ring fenced for uh, Belfast and um, Derry, London Derry. Uh, that there is going to be a serious disadvantage to uh, our area for you know to get investment um, because if it's ring fenced in these areas, we're we're not going to get it. So. Uh, if Margaret um, could just highlight that, that, uh, you know, we need to be treated fairly uh, in any allocation of funding. So our rural dwellers are made sure that we have provision of social and affordable housing in our district. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, thank you, Councillor Coyle. Uh, Councillor O'Coffey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just uh, a few little minor uh, issues I'd like to, if I could, uh, seek for them to be uh, included as part of the um, the document. Um, the the a couple of things I just think it's really useful to have in there, uh, in particular the the comments at the very bottom of page five and the top of page six, which were around the recent uh, upward shift in house prices. Um, there is a spelling mistake on emissions page eight, but I'm sure that'll be picked up at at, at a later stage. But uh, the main issue really is around um, uh, a related issue to that already risen around the um, the lack of capacity in uh, the wastewater treatment. But there's a related issue I think needs to be developed further, which is really that planning permission uh, seems to be disconnected entirely from uh, any guarantees on the provision of uh, you know uh, proper waste treatment. And we have two uh, two estates in, in Fermanagh, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure exactly the situation in the Oma side of things, but there's at least two. There's one in the Skill and one in Garrison, where we have a situation where developers have managed to effectively transfer the responsibility of uh, amending their own uh, access road and their wastewater treatment to the actual people who purchased the house. And this has to be addressed in 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 the legal system somehow. It, it is fundamentally unconscionable that uh, we have uh, a system whereby uh, property speculators and developers can really leave, leave people in the lurch when they buy these houses. So if that could be included, thank you, Chair. Okay, I, I, first of all, I, there's a lot there. Uh, Councillor Curry's looking at, I'll bring in shortly. A, Margaret, I think that the, the water issue and the water treatment was uh, already covered there by our seconder. A, with regard to the, the ring fencing, which was mentioned by Councillor Doyle, uh, Coyle, uh, at this stage, is the proposer and the seconder. We'll ask the proposer first. Are you happy to make those minor amendments? Yes, yes, happy to do that, Chair. And seconder Anne Marie Donnelly, are you willing to incorporate all the amendments, including your own? Yes, Chair. Okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Siobhan Curry. Yes, Guru Margaret Kayerly. It's just briefly just to thank Margaret. Um, I think it's a really good. Um, document, I think a great response and really like the idea of the lifetime um, neighbourhoods idea. I think that's really, really good. It is um, challenging, I think, when people want to stay in the area, but don't have the housing, um, the housing that they might require in the area and it, and it leads to community breakdown. And um, I just think that's a really good addition. Just in um, the consistent unmet rural housing need and um, you know just looking at those areas i'm sure i'm not the only one but certainly as an Aaron north councillor all five deas are on that list for consistently uh unmet rural housing need um, and i do think that that is linked to um some of the issues around town and particularly the water um the infrastructure so i really welcome those points that have been raised there um, by council colleagues and just want to commend um, Margaret for the work. Okay. I'm not sure um, around the ring fencing. Um, I'm really not sure about those comments. Uh, that's news to me, but I'll leave it at that, Chair Gurmaga. Okay. Uh, members, we've had it proposed uh, by Councillor Armstrong, seconded by Anne Marie Donnelly. Um, chair, to chair just a, a for clarification. Um, can some of the officers clarify uh, that ring fence and comment from Councillor Kyle? Because I personally didn't uh, hear that before, but uh, I'm not saying that he's wrong. But I certainly didn't hear it before. And if we're putting something in a in a, a consultation, I think we need to be sure that that, that is. Hey. I have certainly heard it before in the chamber, but I'll, I'll call on Bon Allison if you can make comment on that, please. Hey, Chair, Chair, to the best of my knowledge, uh, we haven't received any official communication that this is the case. I think that what Councillor Coyle was maybe referencing was a, 
a briefing which the then Minister for Communities did um, specifically in relation to the housing stress in uh, social housing stress in North Belfast in particular, but we have received no, uh, certainly I'm not aware of us receiving any formal communications to the effect that uh, there has been designated ring fencing by the department in that regard. Uh, if that's the case, then I would propose that we don't put something like that into the if, if we're only yes and on it. Uh, I, I can't, and we'd look extremely amateurish if, if that's what we do. Okay, thank you. Councillor Coyle. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is actually correct. And if members would like to contact their own minister and see what they said, but it was reported uh, on TV and in local media. So uh, it is widely available. It is going to be ring fenced for um, the two areas that I mentioned. And there's, it's a fact. Members, I'm a bit stuck with this one here. Uh, I'll go back to the original proposer and ask if the original proposer is happy to include this about ring fencing uh, in uh, the proposal. That's Councillor Armstrong. Happy to let it stand. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly, second. I was sorry, Chair. I was going to say the opposite there. If it's not clear. I don't think we should be including something that's not, we're not sure if it's factually correct. So, right. So we're back to square one again here. Uh, Chair, can I make a suggestion? Then can we leave it to the officers to uh, clarify whether that is actually uh, a true reflection of what was said? Uh, I, I'll uh, take their. They are good office that uh, they will be able to come up with uh, what actually was said. Uh, sometimes facts don't turn out to be facts, but uh, I, 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 I trust the office. Okay, uh, uh, thank, you, Seamus. thank you, Seamus. Thank you, Seamus. We'll come back now to Alison on this. Chair, we can certainly do that. The other option, Chair, would be just to emphasise within the response generally that the Council's position would be that full and adequate resourcing should be made available to ensure that the strategy in its full can be delivered for the Fermanagh and Oma District Council area. Uh, Councillor Coyle, are you happy with that? Yes, Chair, I'm happy, but uh, obviously I've hit a nerve in some members. Uh, okay, well, is... no, no, we we're just clarifying the position here. So I take it that the proposer and seconder are happy with the compromise that Alison has said. Yes, Councillor Chair. Yes, Chair. Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Yes, Chair. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we've heard it proposed and seconded. All in agreement. Anybody disagreeing, stick up their hand, please. Okay, it's passed. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to five point three. And that is to consider a report on scheme of emergency finance assistance, the CFA scheme a uh, review, and that was paper C. A uh, Margaret, I think again, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is, but more. This is actually a report which is primarily for information, um, and it's information on the operation of the scheme of emergency financial assistance, which is referred to as the CFA scheme. But there is also a recommendation to seek approval for a letter. <coughs> excuse me to be sent to the Communities Minister requesting a review of some elements of the scheme. Um, as I say, the bulk of the report relates to the explanation of the operation of the CFA scheme. Um, but then due to the impacts of heavy rainfall in early August 2021, earlier this year in fact, environmental health officers responded to 31 service requests in relation to flooding and inspected eight domestic properties in the district which were reported as being impacted by internal flooding. In total, six of those properties met the criteria to avail of the £1,000 severe inconvenience payment. There are elements of the current scheme which have resulted in some residents and businesses in the Fermanagh and Oma district area being excluded from the possibility of seeking financial redress, even though they were significantly impacted. So it's recommended that these issues should be brought to Minister Deirdre Hargey, Communities Minister, for resolution. The elements of the scheme which the council deem unfair would and would ask are revisited and revised. 
include the following. Um, the property for which assistance is being claimed must be the applicant's main place of residence. Um, and this is obviously unfair to those who, ha who have a holiday or second home, which has been affected. The scheme does not cover business premises, which have been flooded internally. Similarly, it's unfair that the business community are excluded completely from the scheme. And then also, the scheme does not apply to outbuildings such as garages or sheds where there are no essential primary household utilities installed, such as a cooker, fridge, freezer, um, or washing machine, and which have been damaged or are unusable. So the recommendation of the report is that the council notes the report on the Department of Communities Scheme of Emergency Financial Assistance, approves the recommendation to write to the Communities Minister, and also notes the information provided by Land and Property Services in relation to rate relief for properties affected by flooding, which is attached as Appendix 1 to the paper. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Uh, the first one looking to speak is Councillor Anthony Thiele. Thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you, Margaret, for the report. And I also want to thank Margaret for um, during that flooding. I was in contact with Margaret a few times on the phone and was very prompt in getting back to me. Yeah, I was. Um, um, that some of this flooding occurred in my own village and some people I knew was affected by it. And I'm glad that they did get the, the compensation because it was a, a fear sympathy for them as well for their houses were destroyed as you don't want that someone had to move out. But I know, I know where, where uh, Margaret is coming from or where the reports come from about holiday homes and second homes where I, I knew uh, a guy there that was after buying a home and spent a lot of money on it. But he hadn't moved in. He's hoping to move in maybe in a year or two's time. He's still working in England, but he's a guy from the town. So a, a great sympathy for him that didn't get it. So maybe it would be no harm to look, look at, into that as our council area is trying to help out people with second homes in Donegal with the with the problem with the migrant and the blocks down there. So I think it uh, it'd be no harm in looking into that. But also some of the the businesses in the town next door to the houses that that was um, flooded was on to me too. Saying it's a pity they didn't get money and thought they were kind of being discriminated by by not getting money. And, and I I said I kind of agreed with them, but I don't think it'd be the the minister the Department of, of, of um, Communities that should be dealing with that as they, they do look after the householders and people living in, 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 in the rural areas. But maybe it'd be no harm, I might be kind of proposing this to write a letter to the, the Minister ministry or the Minister for Economy. Maybe we should look at maybe they should be helping the, the businesses in the area as they really it is economy that should be up after looking after businesses as the Minister for the, the Department of Agriculture to be looking after the land that be flooded. So I think that we should be looking into that maybe and see could they help out some of the businesses that was flooded in the area. That would be my proposal. And um, just it, and also there was a few couple of self care and chalets that was affected that, that, that weekend as well, which would be kind of coming on the business as well as the say with the, the Department of Economy. So I'd be proposing that as well. But just a great sympathy with the with the people was flooded that weekend. And as I said before, there was great turnout that weekend to help out from all the emergency services, fire brigade and all that. So just well done to that. But just I, I was making that proposal to write to the Ministry for Economy for um the businesses. Thank you. Hey, as this is really uh, it, it's uh, back to the Department of Communities. It's there a uh, more or less scheme of proposals. Uh, are, are you looking for a copy to be sent to the Minister uh, of Economy? Is that right? Yes, and see, maybe could they, the Minister of Economy, they, could they do anything for the businesses, if you know what I mean? You know, I, okay, I, know what I think it's included there by Margaret. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks, uh, Councillor Feely. Councillor Coyle? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll second the proposal. I think that the CFA scheme is uh, discriminatory against, uh, you know, uh, like Councillor Feely had said about, uh, you know, second homes. And I thank Margaret for the uh, for bringing this forward. It's I was there in Garrison, and uh, there was a number of houses in Bleak at the, in August that was going to be, you know, maybe might have been flooded, but it is discriminatory and. If the DFC and uh, DFE can work together in a scheme, because we do have residential and we do have uh, businesses and towns and villages right across the district, and you can't you can't uh, you know distinguish 
uh, if everyone is flooded, they should be treated the same and be given the uh, relief uh, of a thousand pound. It only lessens the impact and the you know the the hurt and anger that uh, you know that causes and distress that co it causes to people when their homes are flooded and businesses. So uh, I w welcome this uh, correspondence going to the ministers. Thank you. Okay, Margaret, can I just ask are you clear on the proposal and seconder at the moment? Or do you need any clar further clarification? I think that's okay, Chair. Thank you. Sorry, can you speak up, Margaret? It's very hard to hear you. Sorry, no, I no, I think that's absolutely fine, Chair. Thank okay, you. Okay, that's thank you. I have no other speakers on this, so we've had it proposed by Councillor Feely and second by Councillor Coyle. A uh, for the uh, recommendations plus the extra with regard to the Department of Economy. I uh, is everybody in agreement? If you're not in agreement, please raise your hand. Okay, that's passed. Thank you. We now go on to a uh, 5.4 to consider report and draft climate change and sustainable development action plan. 2021 to 2024 and that was paper d in your papers uh, again margaret thank you chair um the purpose of this report is to seek members approval for the draft climate change and sustainable development action plan 2021 to 2024 three-year action plan and it's the first um of potentially three three-year action plans to deliver on the commitments set out in the Council's Climate Change and Sustainable Development Strategy, Restore, Revive, Thrive, Our Environment, which was approved at the meeting of PNR in February. In developing the draft plan, we worked closely with Nicola Hughes, Director of Sustainable NI, who is critical to the delivery of the draft plan and was able to act as a critical friend, providing challenge and access to a range of examples of good practice and expertise. We worked to refine the 67 high level actions contained within the strategy and combine them into 41 more detailed actions, each of which is linked back to the original outcomes. We have put them under associated themes and members of the Climate Change Resilience Group met on last Friday to consider the draft plan and to propose targets to guide our actions. We fully recognise that we can't fulfil our ambitions alone and we must work in collaboration with others including the statutory community, business and voluntary sectors to achieve our aims. But we must first demonstrate robust climate action ourselves. We have, we have a commitment to strive to achieve best practice through an evidence based approach using the best data available. We have identified some gaps in our baseline data and we need to expand the breadth of emission sources and physical risks that we are aiming to address in the next iteration of this plan. And we're committed to a science based targets approach. Subject to approval and the inclusion of any amendments for tonight, um, we would hope that the draft plan will be professionally designed to include more relevant icons and photographs. As you can see from Appendix 1, it's still in a working document format. With a view to an official launch on the 11th of November 2021 to coincide with Local Government Day at the COP26 event in Glasgow. The launch will also reflect the fact that we will be the first council in Northern Ireland to agree a climate change and sustainable development action plan. Members, we recognise that this is not a perfect plan, but we do feel that we now need to demonstrate our commitment to delivering against our strategy. I have pinched a quote, but it is relevant here. Continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection, and now is the time to act. So the recommendation is that the Council approves the draft climate change and sustainable development action plan 2021 to 2024. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Uh, first one to speak, uh, Councillor Bert Wilson. Councillor Wilson, you're muted. Councillor Wilson, I may come back to you. The next one to speak is Councillor Donald O'Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, first of all, I had my hand up uh, previously for uh, to dissent from the previous votes, just if if that could be recorded. Um, in in regard to this uh, issue, 
Uh, I have a few. Sorry, um, it's, it's too late, uh, Councillor. Well, Parkinson. I did have my hand up. It's obviously your head was down at the time, but anyway. It, uh, I, I'm sorry about that, but uh, <laughs> you should have spoke up. Uh, at well, the you time. said put your hand up. You didn't say speak up. I would have spoke uh, up if you said speak up, but I put my hand up. As okay, Councillor Coffey. We'll, and again, if you speak up, please. Okay. Um, right. Page. Uh, a number. A few little um, minor points, really, um, and one major one. Um, the first thing really is around. Um, there's a comment at the bottom of page seven, which is saying that we need to prepare for hotter, drier summers. Um, there's a lot of evidence I see uh, suggests that it may well be is just as much the case that it could well be hotter, wetter summers. So I don't know whether we want to. Uh, I know it certainly it may be drier in net terms, but we're also likely to see extreme periods of ext uh, severe downpours. And uh, given our water infrastructure, I think that would be a very particularly important thing during summertime. Um, the, 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 the second issue really is around, um, uh, the, like it has to be said that while this is an excellent, there's many excellent, um, uh, remarks in this, we have a draft planning policy and we have an existing planning policy, which effectively leaves open the door for petroleum licensing in our own area. Uh, and this is supposed to be like, a uh, a, a, a preventing or moving towards a carbon zero economy and you cannot match that up with the idea of increasing the licensing of petroleum exploration so i think we need to have some recognition that the planning uh, regime uh, of the council needs to reflect uh, the net zero target that we have the idea of having in 2021 uh, an open door to for example some forms of petroleum exploration which can be in the decades uh, and the idea that that would somehow lead you to have an, a carbon neutral economy in 2042 is ludicrous, frankly. But the, the other point really is around, um, I see there's one reference in the document to the word uh, just transition. And that is on, uh, well, there's actually in the, the uh, in, in, in the very last page, there's a, there's a, a glossary definition, but there's also a definition on page eight, oh, sorry, a, a reference to it. Uh, however, the reference in page eight is actually weaker than the reference at the final page. And the reference in page eight speaks about the need of a, a just transition, improving the environment whilst creating jobs and prosperity. And that's certainly true, but it's completely inadequate. Um, a just transition must also inv involve, as is stated at the final in the glossary, protection for those who, who may lose their jobs and guarantees. And so coffee will be coming shortly to the end of your three minutes. I will indeed. I would have come to it a bit quicker if you hadn't cut across my chair, but uh, I, I think we need to expand upon this and the idea of the central empowerment of workers okay. in is the process. Chair. Is yes, I just want to propose those included points and uh, okay. the, the adoption. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Coffey. Councillor Wilson, I'm coming back to you. You were trying to get in. Can you mute? Okay, I'm not getting Councillor Wilson, so Councillor Emmett uh, McAleer. Chair, can you hear me at any time? Sorry, I can hear you now. If you uh, yeah. continue, now, please. Well, I, as far as climate change is concerned, I listened to a debate on TV not that very long ago. One of the, it was a couple of ladies indeed, and uh, the, the debate brought out, well, what they say anyway. Uh, the fact that the, the manufacturer of uh, cosmetics, uh, the manufacturer of high mat uh, class material uh, for clothing uh, is really creating very high emissions and all the rest. Uh, the conclusion that they came to was that people uh, should be using are going to, to uh, charity shops and uh, reusing the materials that were already there. This is something I would propose that our uh, officers look onto. Is this true? Is it facts? Is it not? And if so, uh, is it not something that needs to be acted on as well as other uh, uh, reasons for uh, uh, acting on, on some of the uh, matters raising with our emissions? So I would propose that this uh, be investigated by the officers and a report brought back as to the truth or other ways uh, in, in that debate. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, with the next speaker I have here is Councillor Emma McAleer. 
Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll start by second the proposals made by Councillor O'Coffey. I think they're they're good and sensible ones. Um, I'd like to say I appreciate and acknowledge the amount of work that goes into drafting these strategies and, and plans, and obviously this is no different for Margaret and her team. But I would ask for one minor adjustment, and it is only a minor adjustment, but I think it's an important one to note, and it's on page 9 of the action plan under the heading or baseline where a statement is made since 2015, 100% of the electricity we purchased has been from renewable sources. Now, we all know from that the industry frequently repeats this statement about 100% renewable and 100% green energy, but in fact, electricity produced from different sources is pooled and it's impossible to buy 100% renewably produced energy. And whilst big companies like SSE and others use the term as a marketing ploy, it's technically incorrect and therefore sh therefore should be avoided. The RHA inquiry highlighted in a pretty stark manner for all of us the need for closer scrutiny of an industry that markets itself under such terms as sustainable and renewable. We must continually exercise our critical judgment as all of us know that greenwashing is not just a market employee, but it's in fact an industry of its own. So the key point here is that we should avoid using terms such as this because they're misleading. So I would propose that we actually don't use that phrase and that term that we're 100% sourcing electricity from renewable sources because it's not technically accurate. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I, you see you've actually seconded Councillor O'Coffey, but you've added a bit. Councillor O'Coffey, are you happy to accept that in your proposal? Yes, I am, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is Councillor John Coyle. Sorry, open mistake, Chair. Okay, Councillor Robert Irvine. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Chair, if we go to page two, the headlines, Margaret, the Council commits to achieving uh, with three aims under that. The, the unfortunate thing is uh, within the district, net carbon zero by 2042, um, we have no control over um, what's happening outside um, our direct operations. We can influence where possible and we can be aided in that influencing role by what happens at Stormont. We've also got to realise that there's two climate change bills coming through, the private members bill and the Diera bill that we've already talked about. And that indeed may change dates and targets. So I, I think uh, we need to uh, put some sort of wording in there that recognises we will do our best within the district, but that it's outside our control. Um, the other dates um, we've already agreed, I presume, uh, within that 2040, though again, that is, a, a, is an issue um, within ourselves. I think that's referenced on page 14 and how we're going to try and do that. So I would like that um, second bullet point there of 2042 uh, amended to take into account that it's not all within our control within the district to actually achieve that target. Thank you. Okay. Hey, next one is Councillor Siobhan Curry. Margaret Cowley, thank you, Chair. Um, just to thank Margaret uh, again for all of the work that's gone into this and just publicly um, put on the council record also our thanks for Nicola Hughes um, from Sustainable NA who has been um, really a great help in, in helping us pull this together. There has been a lot of work done in the group as well and interesting to hear some of the comments um, that are from members of the group um, that have been agreed by the group, but I take it this is the decision making platform. Um, I'm just happy to support um, this um, as it is. I, I do um, support also um, the amendments as outlined by Courier O'Coffee and seconded by Courier McAleer. I think they're sensible. Um, I, I hadn't noticed the one about the, the wetter summers, and I think that's well 
picked up there. So um, just to just to say that I take what um, Councillor Irvine is saying about um, what we can achieve in the council and what is achievable in the district. I don't know really how we get around that, but we have to be ambitious here. Um, and we are the ones who are showing leadership to the district. So um, I would just leave my comments there, but happy to support it otherwise. Okay, uh, next one, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair. Obviously, thank you, Margaret, on, uh, for this uh, extensive uh, report again. Um, there's a lot of work that's gone into it, and I know there's been, been some long evenings put in uh, with us councillors uh, debating back and forward. Uh, again, I, I agree with my colleague, Councillor Irvine, that the, the things that we can't control and that are outside our remit are, are uh, some uh, needs to be highlighted some way. Uh, also, it's strange to hear Councillor McAleer mention about the uh, the green electricity. This, this was something he had pushed very hard for. Uh, and I was quite shocked at the last meeting where Nicola pointed out uh, that it actually doesn't give us any carbon credit at all. The fact that our supplier, because we're still using electric, and the only way that we can get credit is that if we are generating our own electric, and that means we're either putting up turbines we're putting turbines in rivers, or we're uh, we're putting up solar panels to to, uh, to generate that. So that, that's something for councillors to think of further down the line when we are trying to implement this plan. But uh, other than that, I'm, I'm with the amendments. Some of the amendments that are mentioned there, and particularly the one by Councillor Irvine, I'm happy to go with this report. Okay, Councillor Baird. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Obviously, I'm in agreement with my two colleagues on uh, what we can achieve. And I, I don't think it's in our gift uh, to uh, ensure what other people do, i.e. by achieving net zero by 2042. It would be great if that could be done, but it goes back to the argument that I put forward or the, the case I put forward in the previous discussion on what Nilga's position is. Net emissions at least 82 by 2050. Um, I, I just can't support this section of it at all. Uh, therefore, I can't vote for it. Thank you. Okay, well, we have a divergence in opinion here. I, I assume, Councillor O'Coffey, you're not happy to take in Councillor Irvine's uh, proposal within yours. Uh, you'd be correct there, uh, Councillor Thorne. I think it would be a retrograde step. Thank okay, you. Okay, that's fine. So we have two different avenues here. So the first proposal was Councillor O'Coffey, and that was seconded uh, uh, by Councillor McAleer, if I'm right. And uh, right, sure. that is to accept the report, except there's uh, some additions, which also included the uh, electricity element from. Hey, Councillor Michael Lear. I'll bring in the, the Chief Executive before we go to a vote. Thank you, Chair. Chair, it's just really one minor uh, comment, and it's in relation to the specific references made to planning policy. I suppose just to clarify for members, the appropriate forum now for the planning policies to reflect the aspirations of this um, strategy would be through our, our own plan policy work. It wouldn't be the case that planning policy would be set within this document. So I suppose it's just with that clarity, as every strategy is prepared, that's obviously put into the, the local development plan team for consideration and the implications that it will have on policy. So we wouldn't be putting planning policy uh, within this particular plan or uh, strategy and action plan. And I think the uh, provision that's already made within the protection of the environment it will uh, allow for the cross-reference back to the LDP. So just with that point of clarity, Chair. Hey, I go back to the proposer. Are you happy uh, with that? Well, Chair, I, 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 I think that we should uh, have this as a cross-cutting theme, but I, I recognise that unless we want to go back to the drawing board with the plan and policy, I suspect uh, with the greatest will in the world, I wouldn't be able to convince anyone else in the council to do so. So, okay, uh, Councillor McAleer, you're happy uh, to conclude with Councillor Coffey? Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't use the term happy, but I'll, I'll be able no, well, to. Okay, thank you. I never heard you happy yet. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, with regard to it, we've had it. Talking about Tyrone and the All Ireland. 
Of course, that was one. Yeah, yeah, you're quite right. Uh, we've heard it proposed uh, by Councillor Coffey and seconded by Councillor McAleer. Uh, anybody who's dissenting from that, if they could put up their hand, please. So at the moment, I have Councillor Irvine, Councillor Armstrong, Baird, Warrington, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Buchanan, Councillor Thompson, Councillor McLaughrey, and myself, Councillor Bert Wilson. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hey, so that has passed. Okay, now we're moving on now to item five point. Sorry, for, before we do so, Margaret, personally as chair, I would like to thank you for all the work that you put in. There's a, a huge amount of work that's been put into uh, to all those uh, consultations. So I personally thank you as, and along with the thanks of the members. Right, so we're, we're now moved on to 5.5 .5, to consider a report on actions progressed under delegated authority in the period from the 8th of May 2021 to the 26th of August 2021 inclusive. That is paper E. And uh, I just ask Alison to comment on this. Uh, it's to regularise matters, it's not to start talking into matters arising from these papers. Oh, thank you, Chair. That's exactly the case. Members will be aware that the uh, regulations to allow for the hosting of virtual meetings lapsed on the 7th of May and have only recently been uh, re-engaged and re-enacted. So all of our decisions in the intervening period were taken through the Council uh, under delegated authority and appended to the report uh, are the schedule of decisions that were undertaken. So it really just is a proposer and seconder there, Chair, to note the decisions progressed. Okay, uh, the first one up is Councillor Mark Buchanan. Councillor Buchanan, you're muted. Okay, we'll move on. Councillor Ian Keenan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just uh, page 25. No, I'm sorry. These, they, we're not uh, bringing up any matters arising. This is simply a process uh, for a uh, more or less bringing this through the meeting. So we're not actually going through any of the details contained therein. But you, how can you note that if some of the actions haven't been actually taken? I just want to read because it's keeping issue. within the legislation that uh, was missing for a while, and it's more or less uh, legitimising a process. Well, if the action oh, hasn't been talked I'm sorry, that's that 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 is what we're actually doing under this uh, item. Councillor Mark Buchanan, can you can you come in on this now? Okay, we seem to have lost Councillor Councillor Josephine Deacon. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Alison, for your report. Uh, I proposed uh, to note the paper, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Josephine. And do we have a seconder, Councillor Wilson? No answer from Councillor Buchanan or from Councillor Wilson. So I go on to Councillor Mary Garrity. Thank you, Chair, and I'll second. Okay, thank you, uh, Mary. Uh, you've heard it proposed and seconded that uh, we pass uh, this uh, these papers. All in agreement. Any dissensions? I could ask Councillor Bert yeah. Wilson and Mark Buchanan to drop their hands, please. Yeah, I understand from that. Yeah. You dissent from that? Yeah. Okay. Councillor Keenan dissents from that. Could somebody get in touch with Mark uh, Buchanan? His hand seems to be permanently up, please. Ask uh, Councillor Robinson, please. Okay, members, that's passed. We now move on to item 5.6 to, cons to consider minutes of Fermananoma Health and Social Care Services Subcommittee held on the 2nd of July 2021, Paper F. 
Uh, this is to ratify uh, the minutes and recommendations. Thank you, Chair Councillor. Uh, Erskine is not, is not in attendance this evening, so it would just be any of the members, Chair, who were present at the meeting. If we had a proposer and seconder, please. Okay, so I can't call on the Chair. So, uh, Councillor Coffey? Not a member, a, Chair, no. You're not a member of this? No, uh, but there is an issue I wanted to raise on it. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's Sorry. in relation to um, there's uh, there's a reference in this to uh, this uh, new rollout of um, hospital at home. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hold on, hold on, I think hold, it's hold, the, hold, hold on, Donald. Sorry, hold on. Yeah, we'll have to go through that for accuracy. For no, sorry, hold on. We don't have to go through. Hold on, hold on, please. We don't have to consider their accuracy. That's for the next. Sorry, Councillor Coffey. Yeah. Uh, what we want is the adoption of the minutes. Uh, yes, first I, of all, I want to raise an issue on this hospital at home, if I can. Then, sure. Thank you. Right. Well, hold on. We have to get uh, the, the minutes adopted first of all. So I'm looking for two members who were present at this meeting to propose and second the adoption of the minutes. Chair. Yes. Chair Councillor Thompson here. Uh, in the absence of Councillor Erskine, I'm happy to propose the adoption of the minutes. Thank you. Okay, and do we have a seconder for that, please? Councillor Deacon, are you happy to second that? Yes, I'll second, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And any member that was present that's in disagreement with that, please uh, inform me now. And uh, I'll put it over to Alison here, please. Chair, so just in terms of the, the matters arising for this meeting will now be dealt with at the next meeting of the Health and Social Care Services Subcommittee. That was the agreement of the Council that such matters would be dealt with by the subcommittee. So as such, once we have the minutes adopted, we'd be moving on now to the next item. We will, Chair, be circulating two members in advance of that meeting if there are any particular matters they wish the Trust or other representatives to raise uh, at our meeting in October. Okay, thank you, Alison, for the clarification. Uh, Chair, do I get to raise this issue now on the hospitals at home issue? Because it's actually resulting in severe, um, you know, privation among local residents, which I would like to raise in the council to which I'm elected. Okay, I'm being told no, uh, Donald, in this in the context of this. Chair, so you're get... the chairman of this meeting. Uh, it's your decision. I, I agree, uh, Donald, but there is processes here that I have to adhere to with a uh, subcommittees and so on. So and where where do I, as an elected representative, uh, in a public forum, raise issues causing severe, and I genuinely mean this, severe privation to individuals? Uh, I I have no recourse to anything uh, in public as an elected representative. I understand your concern, and I will put it to the chief executive here to answer you, please. Chair Councillor O'Coffey, or indeed any other member, can submit their queries, issues, matters they wish raised at the Health and Social Care Subcommittee. As members are aware, all members may attend and it's also streamed live. So that would be the appropriate forum for this matter to be raised. Chair, I, I cannot actually raise that at that because I am not fit to ask a question anymore because I have lost my seat on that since it was open to the media. No, but that, I think that's incorrect, uh, Councillor. I think you, you um, your position in terms of the de haunt allocation, uh, it, it wasn't a position that was open to you. But in terms of the matter can be raised on your behalf by any member of the subcommittee. If you would like to submit it in, in writing, that can certainly be raised. Chair, I, I, I'm not a member of a party, so do uh, uh, not like yourself. I don't have colleagues to raise it, Chair. Donald, I mean, this is a process and it's now a more or less a subcommittee, so I have to comply with the guidelines that are that are being provided. So hopefully you can raise it with a member. A uh, or officers, uh, if you make the point to officers, it can be raised at the, the committee. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Coffey, you can put your hand down. Okay, five point seven, and this is to receive verbal update on agreed actions from the Rural Affairs subcommittee meeting held on the 9th of September 2021. Again, I'll hand over to Alison. 
Thank you, Chair. There were three uh, key actions. Obviously, the minutes from the last week's meeting and indeed this previous special meeting will be considered at, at policy and resources in October. Uh, but the three key actions that were recommended by the subcommittee chair were firstly, that the council would make urgent representations to the Department for Infrastructure, requesting an opportunity for the council to respond to the closed consultation on the proposed amendments to the funding methodology for rural transport groups. Um, and to specifically highlight the impact, the, dis, um, the disproportionate adverse impact that this is having on our district and to formally seek an engagement with the Minister on, on the subject. Secondly, Chair, the um, subcommittee agreed the, the paper and recommendations associated with the proposal to bring forward the remote working hub strategy, which will include the mapping uh, the analysis of, of potential locations and also the site visits to cross-border locations, including two partners in Leitrim, Cavan and Donegal. And finally, Chair, and it, it was acknowledged that it was outside of the remit of the subcommittee, but given the urgency of the matter, the, the Chair accepted it. It was that we would make representations to LOCKS Agency and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency to clarify the specific resources they have put into the various investigations uh, and in particular, uh, sorry, recent instances of river pollution and in particular uh, the recent uh, occasion at Kesh. So those were the three key actions, Chair, for, for members to approve, please. OK, I'm going to call on Councillor Green to uh, ratify the minutes and indeed propose the recommendations. Councillor Green. Uh, yeah, I uh, have no problem doing that. And I'm just wondering, uh, would you give me a wee bit of leeway on a rural matter that is of some urgency at the minute that I just wanted to, to raise, if, if that was OK? I, really, it should be any other business. I, but if it's very quick I, and can be dealt with quickly, yeah. I'll allow you this yeah. time. Uh, it's just that I want to propose that a letter is wrote to the Minister of Education in relation to the, the school buses. Sorry, sorry, Councillor Minister. Green. This is actually an item off any other business which has been raised and will be dealt with later in the meeting. Oh, right. If that's the case, then no problem. I'm uh, so, happy enough to. Uh, sorry, there, there's somebody else uh, already. Uh, uh, Councillor Arms. No bother. Uh, that's, request that's, that's that. the case. No, no problem. No problem. Councillor Feely? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll no bother second, second the proposal and, and I'm glad that the school bus issue has come up for a comment to make on it too. That's okay, how would you ask that? You're second the ratification of the minutes and the uh, recommendations made. Yes, yes. Thank, yes. You, thank you very much. Okay, Councillor McAleer? Uh, thank you, Chair, no, in supportive of the, the, or happy to note the minutes and just to Thank the the chair of that particular group and the members for allowing me to bring forward the proposal on the on the water quality and the the river spill down in case. I think it's obviously okay. a very timely issue, so it was great to get it on. I uh, could I just clarify in terms of procedure there. I know Councillor Green is the chair, but how how was he being permitted to speak on that issue when Councillor Coffey wasn't permitted on the on the previous one, chair? Because he was chair of the subcommittee and he was ratified and I decided that it was short and it was to do with rural affairs so that he's chair of the subcommittee that I would permit it as long as it was short. My decision will move on. A, we're now on to a item six, six point one, and this is to consider a report on financial matters. Paper G, and I'll hand over to Celine on this one. Chair, there are th three matters for decision making in this paper, and uh, a further three matters for information. Um, the detail is all set out in the report and in the appendices. There's an update on the management accounts. There is uh, information on the prudential and treasury uh, prudential indicators for quarter one of 21-22. And there's an update of the council's credit card policy. Um, I'll just take you through to the recommendations, which is that the council would approve those management accounts for the period to the 30th of June, approve the prudential and treasury indicators for the period April to June 21, and approve the amendment to the council's credit card policy to allow for three uh, credit cards. Also, that uh, the council notes the first quarter actual penny product information from April to June 2021, first quarter derating grant, 
for April to June 2021 and an update on the rate support grant funding issues for 20, 20, sorry, 2021 and 2022. Okay, Councillor Coffey. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just on um, the first, uh, under the appendix one, I, I, I think it's useful to note that we are now running at, uh, over this the first quarter uh, effectively a 2 million surplus on the first quarter. Uh, perhaps that's something we can come back to at a later point in the year and see how we're progressing on with that. Um, a number of maybe questions uh, around the uh, the situation I see. Uh, it says that we have uh, got rid of the uh, the loan that we had to um, um, our city, uh, Banbridge and Craig Avonborough Council of 4.5 million, but it still appears in the, uh, the, uh, the table there just to clarify. Uh, I take it that that is it'll no longer appear and um, uh, do we it was obviously at a higher rate of interest that we were loaning that money to another council and then than we were achieving elsewhere. So is there are, are there any uh, similar plans to do something uh, like that in the future? Um, and the other point really is around uh, capital expenditure. I note that uh, we have a capital expenditure for the quarter of 1.623 million. Uh, we're forecasting a uh, capital expenditure of 13 million. And I do recall uh, when we were setting uh, the the rates the last time, and one of the questions I certainly would have been raising, I know others maybe, is around our ability to deliver capital projects. And obviously 1.6 million is significantly below one quarter. So uh, there may be a degree of this coming in at the end, but really is, there, is there a, uh, are, are the directors confident that we will achieve the 13 million expenditure by the end of the year. Thank you, Chair. Okay, are you uh, proposing the recommendations on clarification of those points? Is that yes, correct? Chair, I'll do that. Thanks. Uh, Celine, can you make up? Yes, um, Chair, in relation to the management accounts, yes, we, we do have a favourable position and a number of factors contributing to that. Um, we are still in difficult enough times to predict in terms of uh, income levels in some of our facilities, which have only opened more recently. Um, so our, our budget is a bit more fluid in this year, but as the councillor rightly points out, it's quarter one. Um, members will recall in July, um, we took forward a number of environments where we were proposing to move monies to um, other uh, other expenditures and uh, and projects, and those are not reflected in these figures. So it it is, a situation that we are actively managing and, and working through and we will continue to report to members and seek the appropriate approvals on that. In relation to the query on Table 1 of Appendix 2, um, the, that table is, this report is to the 30th of June. Uh, at the 30th of June, that sum was outstanding from Armagh City, Banbridge and Craig Avonborough Council and as reported, it was repaid on the 14th of July, so it is correct that it, it should be there. Again, as previously reported to members, um, this arrangement, which was regulated through our through financial advisors uh, that that the council has appointed, was at a, a preferential rate. Um, we are we have indicated uh, that we are still open to these type of arrangements um, and again, where they do offer a rate, because quite simply, as members can see, the interest rates uh, available for, for any surplus uh, cash at this point in time are very, very low. Um, but uh, that, that money is repaid and we are actively looking at, at other arrangements where they are needed. And again, there are some reciprocal benefits in doing that. The issue of the capital expenditure of 1.6 million, um, again, those figures are accurate and reflect what has been delivered in the first quarter. Um, it's not an even profile um, of, of exactly, you know, as you again, you members will see in the procurement report as, as various items are, are tendered. And then there are many issues that will impact on, on actual project delivery. Um, in terms of whether the it, it's probably equally too early to say as to whether the 13 million uh, capital fund target um, is a capital expenditure target will be met in this year. Uh, but again, it's something that we would bring back to members at an earlier point uh, in the year if if we feel that 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 position needs to be revised down. Um, sometimes just projects maybe for planning or other reasons, um, other funding reasons uh, may not go according to plan. But uh, we do, we did 
um, and it is notable that we did hit the target for the 2021 year, which was just a figure of just over £10 million. Um, but yes, it, it is a challenge just to, to, to have all of the, the, the staffing resource and the capacity to deliver on those, and uh, we keep that under review. Okay, thank you, Celine. I just remind members with regard to a, there's a lot of complicated figures, and so in in in, in these these figures, uh, Celine did ask in advance, uh, you know, that if any queries were to come up, uh, that you make them prior to the meeting, uh, so she can be prepared and that we maybe alleviate uh, concerns, but uh, that's for the future. Uh, Councillor McCann. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just to thank Celine and the team for all the ongoing hard work and happy to second the recommendations there. Okay, thank you, Councillor McCann. Councillor Robert Irvine. All right, thank you, Chair. Councillor McCann got in before me. Um, just a few comments. Um, I think Celine is correct. Uh, there are external influences that are definitely affecting the delivery of our capital programme. Um, I think at the moment we are adequately resourced. Uh, something that we as councillors and ratepayers will have to bear in mind on the back of looking at our climate change and sustainable development plan, the aspirations contained with that plan are going to have a direct impact uh, on our capital expenditure over the next 10 to 20 years, uh, probably starting uh, fairly soon. And to actually achieve that, we as a council are going to have to look one at the funding and financing of that plan that sits behind the actions that sit behind the plan um, and two realize that there is a direct cost um, some of it will be partially returned hopefully by central government grants but not all of it so um, what we're, we're doing or what we've agreed to do come with a cost and providing leadership comes with a cost, we've got to be prepared to stand up to that and do it. And at some stage in the future, I think our officers will have to bring forward uh, a plan that uh, aligns itself to that climate change and sustainable development plan and also the costs attaching. And we as councillors will have to make probably difficult choices in regard to what we can and can't do. So. There's a lot of challenge ahead for ourselves and for our rate pairs. But again, thank you, Celine, for a good job. Well done. Keep it up. Okay, Councillor Irwin, Councillor Curry. Yes, Gormagata Kayerly, thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks, Celine, for the report. I'm just raising a matter under um this financial report, which I have been in contact with Celine about today. Chair, if you'd allow me in now on it. Okay, if you come in now. Please. Yeah, it's just around the recent announcement um, and uh, members may have heard the finance minister, um, Connor Murphy, um, welcoming the move by three um, mobile networks to not to um, reintroduce roaming charges um, on um, the island. Um, that um, they're not going to do that. And I think that that's very welcome, but this does impact then on our own council. Um, given that our council contracts um, are with a different provider. So I had just contacted Celine today. Maybe, maybe Celine has some information around how much we're currently um, paying out in contracts to Vodafone. Um, and just, I think that we should make representation um, to them and maybe to other um, okay. neighbors too, just on behalf of the people of the district chair, I think it is in the public interest and it's something we did anticipate with Brexit. Okay, um, so you put saying. it to Celine today. So I'll ask, I'll ask Celine, has she an answer at this stage or whether to report further? Lean's on mute there, Chair. Apologies. Uh, Chair and uh, councillors, uh, the council has contracts with both Vodafone and O2, and the factors which influence um, which of those services we use is has to date primarily been around coverage. 
um, in that there has been some problems with coverage, um, mobile phone coverage in, in some parts of the district. Now, that may may change or may have changed with, with um, further investment that there has been in, in some uh, infrastructure and connectivity, but, but I don't know. Um, but currently, we... Um, our, our expenditure with Vodafone would be in the region of 40,000 per year and with O2 it would be in the region of 18,000 per year. So um, if Roman charges were introduced, um, that would be a, a factor that, that potentially again um, could be outside of our control as to how those those do come into play and, and, and could result in some additional charges to those bills. So um, it, it's something that we do need to keep an eye on and, and if, if at members discretion need to make representations on, well then that's something we can do. Okay, we'll give you some time then Celine to, to, to look into it further and report back. Uh, Councillor Raymond, back earlier. Thank you, Chair. Yet um, two points, I suppose. The first one, picking up on on what Councillor Coffey referenced, and I suppose what, given the fact that it's still early in the year, but the fact that we do have those savings accumulating or that money accumulating, um, hopefully, whenever uh, we're revisiting the rates in the new year, uh, Councillor Keenan's proposal of last year will be kept in mind. The second thing, and I should probably just to note at this stage, but looking through the the list of banks or financial institutions that we're actually banking with. I note that that AIB uh, isn't one of them, and I, I suppose just given what's going on in OMA, uh, it would have been an idea maybe if they were threatening to withdraw or continue to threaten to withdraw from OMA that we would remove our, our savings with them. I'm wondering, I suppose, just given some of the other uh, names that are on there, and I know that the Bank of Ireland have closed the branch recently in Listen to Ski, given Given, I suppose, any further threats to cut services or cut uh, provi provision in our rural district, it may be an idea that we revisit who we bank with um, on those provisos that, that if people aren't going to provide the service to our local communities, maybe we go back to the, the financial institutions that we're with and just play them at their own game and say, well, if you're not going to help the people that we're here to represent, we're not going to contribute to your profits at the end of the year and um, so just a point for for noting at the minute chair Thank okay you. so we, we've had it proposed by councillor coffee seconded by councillor uh, mccann uh, we accept the recommendations anybody in disagreement with that put up their hand councillor curry you still have your hand up right so that's passed okay mm. thank you and Chair, um, just an oversight on my part, and just as, as the member draws my attention to the specific list of banks there, I do have to declare an interest in that a family member is employed uh, by a subsidiary company of one of the banks. So uh, apologies on my behalf for that, but uh, just to make sure that that's in the interest of transparency, that that's on the record. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to 6.2, and that's to consider a report on statement of accounts for the year ended 31st of March. 2021 incorporate the annual government statement paper H and again Celine uh, Chair members this is the annual statement of accounts for the year 2020-21 so that's from the 1st of April 2020 to the 31st of March 2021 um, those uh, figures were reported previously to council as management accounts in June of this year and also the governance statement, which is one of the key documents, was also previously uh, reported to Council. Um, the figures and the statements and the Northern Ireland Audit Office's um, review uh, and audit of those figures was considered this morning by the audit panel of the committee. Um, they received presentation and uh, received then a report from the audit committee in connection with those, those figures. Um, there, is a lot of information in this. Um, we've we've tried to summarise it there and, and provide an overview, um, and and also highlight the key statements. But the full uh, statement of accounts, which runs to over a hundred pages, is available to members currently on decision time. Um, the finalised document uh, once it, once it is signed uh, by by all the uh, relevant signatories will be published on the council's website and will be available for all. The recommendations at section 8 is that the council approves the statement of accounts for the year ended 31st of March, subject to any amendments required following the conclusion of the audit. 
and that the chair of the Policy and Resources Committee um, is, is, is approves the signature of the final audited statement of accounts on or before the 30th of September, following certification by the Chief Financial Officer, which is Chief Executive. Thank you, Celine. Uh, Councillor Warrington. Yes, thank you, and thank you for that, Celine. I, I propose them recommendations, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Swift. Second that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernice. Uh, nobody else looking in, so we've heard uh, proposed and seconded the, that we accept the recommendations. Anybody in disagreement, please stick your hand up or say now. Okay, that's passed. We move on now to 6.3, to consider update report on procurement and tenders, paper I, again, Celine. Chair, members, monthly procurement report which outlines um, three tender awards that are for your approval because there's only been one submission. Um, information on tenders to be issued uh, and then for information uh, tenders that have been awarded as part of our delegated authority set out at 3.1 uh, and then some further updates at 3.2 and, uh, and 4. And the recommendations set out on page seven at item 10 are as, as stated there around the approval, the uh, proposed tender issues, and then um, the information on the tenders awarded and extensions to contracts. Okay, thank you, Celine. Councillor Mary Gard. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Celine. Just and to propose recommendations, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Again, Chairman, thanks, Celine, for the report and happy to second the recommendations. Thank you very much. Uh, members, you've heard it proposed and seconded to accept the recommendations. Any dissenters, please put their hand up. Councillor Garty, if you could knock your hand down, please. Sorry, Chair, can I? <clears throat> it's a question of clarity, I suppose there, there presumably is nothing in it, but I'm aware that. Um, one of the businesses listed there was a uh, Galaxy facility, Galaxy facilities, and I know Councillor Yardy had previously made a proposal to invite them in or bring them into the council. So I'm just double checking that there's no conflict of interest running there. I'm sure it's absolutely not, but just to double check. I'm sure it. that's up to the member if they wish to declare an interest. So I have no hands, so that has been passed. Thank you. We're six point four to consider a report on meeting arrangements, Peter Paper J. Is that Chair, um, obviously this yes takes into account um, I suppose where we are now and and we we had over the summer actively sought to plan for for what um, what our arrangements meeting arrangements would or could be like into the future um, and with with a view to I suppose resuming uh, or, or certainly moving to to a new normal. Um, the information there provides uh, we've provided information on on the arrangements that we could have for in person meetings, um, also then remote meetings, and then we've just updated you on the electronic voting. Um, but I suppose we have we have included there a, a proposed or a draft schedule of of meetings that would be in chamber meetings for the period October to December 2021. That's detailed at Appendix One. Uh, but we're very much officers, um, you know, would be led by members' direction on this, and that time frame can be altered uh, or deferred. We can revisit this this situation in a number of months. Um, obviously, our current arrangements have been influenced by um, the COVID pandemic, and then the legislative position around the virtual meetings and the public health guidelines uh, in in relation to meetings, and. Uh, I suppose the situation ebbs and flows a little bit um, and we, we're aware that there is still significant public health risk has been highlighted. Um, equally, there has been relaxation of uh, of the restrictions. So um, we, we would like, uh, as the recommendation sets out there, um, to members to note and consider the options for meeting arrangements and then if we can reach an agreement of, of how we wish to proceed over the next few months that would certainly help with with planning and arrangements and also that we would adopt the electronic voting which is um, is, is, is easier to ensure a, an accurate vote record uh, and quicker than we think we believe it was quicker than uh, the roll call but but really that's that's our alternatives if we don't do the, the electronic vote then we need to uh, we need to do a roll call each time and, and I know that can be quite time consuming so two issues there really for chair for discussion I think that there are two different discussion points so okay. 
I, I think that the first one we'll look at on its own is the approve adopting the electronic voting option for members attending meetings uh, remotely via WebEx. Uh, Josephine, uh, you're first, Eric. Yes, uh, thank Jane. you, Chair, uh, and uh, thank you, Celine, for your report and to all the team for the hard work that they've put into this and for uh, the very detailed consideration uh, of the risks and benefits to us. First of all, uh, Chair, if you're if you're taking this in two parts in respect of the electronic voting, uh, yes. we recently had uh, instruction on this. I find it very straightforward and I would like to uh, propose that we accept that recommendation, Chair. Thank okay. You. A, I'll come back to you, Josephine, on the second part first, but a, I have a seconder, a, or is there a wish for discussion on the electronic voting, which I'm dealing with separately here? Councillor Irvine? Uh, I'm happy to second um, Councillor Deacon's proposal on the electronic voting, but I wish to speak on the other items. Okay, that's, that's fine. A, Councillor Thompson, a, you wish to speak on the... A, no, oh, I'm happy, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy enough with the electronic voting and happy to support that. Okay. Well, I think I think we've clarity on that particular part uh, before we go into maybe a discussion on the second part. Is there anybody on the verbally could uh, dissent uh, if they are not in agreement with the electronic voting? Could you verbally dissent because there are hands still up? Okay, I'm taking that as a positive, so that's passed. And I assume, a uh, Celine, we're talking about starting. Are we starting next week? Or are we starting next month? Next month, next month, chair. I am getting confirmation next month, so we'll be starting that at the council meeting. Uh, early next month. Now, so thank you. We've got that issue out of the road. Uh, I know the first speaker was uh, Councillor Deacon, and we're now dealing with the second part, which is regard regard to meetings. Uh, Councillor uh, Dayton. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I am aware uh, that uh, many members do miss uh, having face-to-face uh, -face meetings, uh, and I also am aware that some councillors, um, you know, for personal reasons, um, would prefer to continue uh, uh, remote meetings. I think the hybrid model is an excellent way uh, to proceed. It gives members the option of joining either in person or uh, or, or online if that is what they feel most comfortable with. Um, uh, Celine is quite right, Chair, when she said that the situation in relation to the COVID pandemic is very fluid. Um, we have seen exceptionally high rates of COVID infection in our own district council area, which is clearly a matter of concern. Uh, so, I mean, we're certainly uh, the pandemic is still alive and well, and we need to be mindful of it. But I think this is a reasonable compromise. I think it's reasonable that we should start this system uh, from next month onwards. And accordingly, I'm happy to propose the recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Dean. And Councillor Irvine was second to come in. Thank you very much, Chair. Hard. Um, uh, I, I have to take a divergent view from Josephine in regard to in-person meetings um, from, I suppose, several stands. If we look at the remote meetings, I think if we take those as two separate things. The smaller meetings and the subcommittee meetings, with the exception of the planning committee, I would happy that they continue as they are in regard to remote and anybody that has broadband accents can come in and use a separate room and join as if they were in their, their own house and it's a, a purely remote meeting. I would be happy to propose that and that continues. Going back to our committee meetings and council meetings, I, I think there's an equality issue here, um, an equality issue from um, people who would like to join and because there's a cutoff of numbers can't join, and could be forced then into hybrid. And those that don't want to join and want to stay at home may feel left out because the majority of members are going back to sort of face to face. So 
I think whilst we're still in a period of fluidity uh, with regard to what's going on, we have come to a level of compromise with our main committee meetings where we've adjusted our standing orders. It's not perfect. Um, I agree there are issues with connectivity that affect about three or four members, maybe up to five at times, not all the time. But from the point of view of access, we all are achieving the same access apart from the chair and the officers who are in the chamber. We all are, are carrying through and we can interact on that sort of level. And I feel until you get either all in or all out, uh, I would be against uh, a hybrid. Uh, okay. System. So, uh, so, so, I mean, so, just clarifying here, you're proposing that we continue with remote meetings uh, for an indefinite period. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Well, yes. Uh, I, I, I'm proposing that our main council meeting should still stay remote as well. Okay, I'm thank you. Uh, thank Councillor you. Thompson, uh, you were next in the line. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And again, thanks, Celine and all the team for a very, very comprehensive report and a lot of work has went into that. Uh, I suppose uh, I'd agree with Councillor Irvine with regard to the subcommittees working groups remaining uh, via WebEx or Zoom or Teams. I think that's probably the way forward for, for those. With regard to uh, the full council and the main committees of council, uh, I would I would be very much in favour when, when the time comes. Uh, and I know probably we're not there yet by what we're hearing from the health professionals that uh, we start meeting in person again. Because I find that uh, the form, the formality has been lost with regard to full council and the main committees. And I think that needs to be formal and structured. And when people can't get on and you're calling them several times to come on and they're muting and they're not, they're all muting. And it's, it's just, uh, it's just a bit of a mix up to be honest. So, uh, uh, just, to clarify, just to clarify, uh, Councillor Thompson, are, are you actually saying that uh, we don't start this in October, but that you would go for full? I would go full, uh, full attendance when 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 it when it's permitted, and and I know <laughs> a lot of people out there thinks, are we going to be in this situation forever? And that's just putting the bluntly chair. Okay, you know, well, I mean, is that so? Forever and ever. I, I understand. So we need to get back to some sort of a reality here. Okay, I, I, I'll i take take your views here and, and, and to account. I'll come on to uh, Councillor Coffey. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I have one real question of how this would work uh, if it was a hybrid meeting, because uh, I, I'm sure we all have our experiences of. Uh, decisions on this, that, and the other not going in our way at times, uh, and even the order of speakers is quite clear, I think, mostly, who has the hand up. Now, I, I know that there can be glitches and so on, and people end up, like yourself yesterday, going to the bottom of the pile, even though you had your hand up to start off with. Um, but in general, there's a clear order. How would it work if it was hybrid? That's a question, uh, because obviously some, would, would everyone use the system, the same system? Would it allow us to have uh, continue televised uh, broadcast? Because I do believe more that the numbers actually watching. I don't know really why, but uh, quite a lot of people do watch these meetings and uh, they could derive a good bit out of it. Uh, I think that's something that's really one of the few positives that's come out of the whole thing. Um, but uh, in general, I have to say I, I am concerned. Um, all of us, uh, unfortunately, the demographics of the councillors uh, as a group, are, uh, it tends towards uh, the upper scale uh, in terms of the age profile, and many of us may be having uh, conditions and so on. And I would genuinely be concerned that, uh, you know, uh, we could do something which might appear rational, uh, but might actually end up with one, you know, an, an unfortunate consequences. So. I, I think we should adopt a, a, a precautionary approach. And uh, frankly, I, I think it's saving a lot of money 
uh, us not having to drive up and down is saving a lot of carbon, us not having to run up and down. And uh, finally, on the point of uh, the last uh, speaker just raised uh, there um, around, uh, you know, want to get back to normal. I would actually question whether our normal has changed slightly and that we need to change our outlook as to what is the, the new normal. Uh, if this uh, is a pandemic, which is not going to go away in a hurry, then perhaps we just need to adopt uh, to, to it and to, to find new ways to do things it, it, it just as well. Thank you, Joe. So I, I take it, Councillor Coffey, you're actually agreeing with Councillor Irvine that we yeah. Re, re, yeah. retain. Re, I, there was one point I wanted to make, actually. I, I The one thing is definitely clear to me is a lot of uh, the lower meetings, which Councillor Irvine was stating, there's like the smaller committees and so on, where these involve uh, members of the community. Um, I, I, I'm just thinking of neighborhood renewal. I often hear, uh, you know, the, there's a desire for format to enable people actually come together in a safe way. I think that that sort of thing we should look at how we can enable that. Uh, but uh, necessarily with the full council meetings, I don't think it's really the right time to start down that road. Okay. Okay. Uh... The next one to speak here is Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I was just going to come in, uh, and I think by the sound of it, most people seem to be in agreement with them. Uh, second, Councillor Irvine's proposal that uh, until it's safe to do so, we continue, continue with everybody staying at home apart from the chairs and the officers. And it's such time that uh, once it is safe that we all come together, we, we don't okay. want the same thing. Same hue and cry we had whenever we suggested smaller committees where some were going to be excluded who can't attend and others can. Okay. So you're in agreement with Councillor Irvine, Councillor Coffey. A uh, next one on the list is Councillor Bert Wilson. Bert, you're muted. Chair. Yes, come on ahead. Can you hear? Quickly. Yes. yes. No, well, I, I as one of the councillors have probably the, the the had the most problems. I would think uh, trying to contact uh, with contacts. Uh, it to be, have done a very good job, and uh, mostly I can uh, uh, join into the meetings and take uh, part in them, and I'm delighted with that. I do not be delighted when I get home from Anishkillen at twelve o'clock at night. And I'm sure it's the same for the Anishkillen people from Oma. And uh, I would be quite happy to work as we are doing it. So present. you're talking about remote and with, uh, with yes, a, uh, yes, and a and for teacher. health, uh, I don't think when we look at uh, the uh, number of cases of uh, coronavirus at this minute in time, I think uh, for the health and the safety of our councillors okay. and uh, somebody mentioned about elderly well i think i've uh, probably the, the, one of the ones that he was, could be classed as that so i'm quite happy uh, to uh, agree with uh, uh, councillor sure. evan Thank okay you. then councillor mcguire uh, good morning i uh, heard and i have to say i'm slightly more confused now than i was at the start of the discussion uh I thought we were going to make a decision whether to go for all in or a hybrid uh, model. And uh, I would have been inclined towards uh, the hybrid model, given that the pandemic's not over. Right. But I personally would say an in-person meeting uh, where we meet together uh, uh, as, as, as real people uh, creates a, a harmony that is slightly lost in the virtual world. Uh, yes. Speaking from some experience, the uh, the the ruling and the proceeding of a meeting in a hybrid fashion has has taken some order lately, but it took us quite some while to get to that state of order, and sometimes it's not perfect. Nor would the physical meetings be perfect either. I'm aware of that that tempers can get frayed and issues can be real, but uh, I think we we should be striving to get back to physical meetings as soon as possible and in the interim i would be quite happy with a, a hybrid version uh, as as councillor wilson said a long journey from inniskillen to his place uh, other councillors long way from some parts of fermanagh to oma 
okay. the option to stay at home for those counsellors and anyone that that feels that, uh, that coming together in a physical arena, I think uh, I think personally it would be beneficial. I think the old style physical meetings come back over ten years now. You have experience that uh, work can be done, and I think it can be done slightly more efficient in the room as opposed to on the virtual. Whereas it is working in the emergency situation, but it's not where we really should be aiming for. So I, I'd be inclined towards the a hybrid model. Hybrid. And okay. I think we need to bring it out, uh, roll it out in some form or fashion. And again, of course, obviously it's not set in stone. If we feel it's not working, we can obviously up back again. I, that's more or less my conversation piece on it, Chair. Uh, okay, well, really, I, I've had a really consensus there. I was trying to get a good consensus right round. And what I'm being left with really is like we would all like full attendance if the health conditions were, were were such that it was safe and so on. But the main two consensus there was the hybrid, which was proposed by uh, Councillor Dean and uh, seconded by Councillor McGuire. But preceding that, we had a proposal, a uh, wrote continue for the interim period and that was from councillor Irvine and supported by councillor coffee hey i'm going to put that councillor Irvine's because it was seconded first to the vote and uh, could those who dissent from that could we all take down our hands please councillor mcguire okay anybody who dissents from councillor Irvine's proposal seconded by councillor coffee to remain with remote meetings in the interim period and not start off in October with the hybrid system, uh, please put up their hands. Now, if you just keep your hands up the way we can make it. Well, sure. I'm not sure why, but my hand on this, um, it's just not, it's not, just not been raised at my end, although I'm pressing the button here. Hey, uh, well then, if we're going to have a disparity over it, I'll have to quickly go through the whole list again. Hey, uh, right, we're going to Councillor Irvine's uh, proposal for remote, and I'm. Everybody take down their hands, please. I'll have to go through by the end to make sure we've got an accurate record. Councillor Armstrong. Four. Councillor Baird. Four. Councillor Bale's not here. Councillor Blake. Against. Councillor Buchanan. Against. Councillor Campbell. Councillor Glenn Campbell. Against. Against. Uh, Councillor Sean Clark. Sean still here? Yeah, against. Against, right. Councillor John Coyle. Against. Councillor Curry. An A against. Councillor Dehan. Against. Uh, Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Against. Councillor Sean Donnelly. Against. Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Four. Councillor Keith Elliott. Against. Councillor Deborah Erskine, not present. Councillor Anthony Feely. Against. Councillor Anne Marie Fitzgerald, apology. Councillor Adam Gannon, apology. Councillor Mary Garty. Against, Chair. Councillor Seamus Green. Against. Councillor Robert Irvine. Four. Councillor Eamon Keenan. Four. Councillor Catherine Kelly. Against. Councillor Patrick Ian Kelly. I'm assuming that was against, is that correct? Yes, against. Okay, thank you. Councillor Tommy McGuire. In the on against. Okay, Councillor um, Michael Lear. Four. Hey, Councillor Chris McCaffrey. Councillor Chris McCaffrey. Okay, I'll come back. Councillor Stephen McCann. Councillor Stephen McCann. Come back, Councillor John McLaughlin. Four. 
Councillor Barry Michael Duff is not here tonight. Councillor Gavin McPhillips? Against. Councillor Donald O'Coffey? Or Councillor Thomas O'Reilly? Against. Councillor Alan Rainey? Councillor Rainey? Councillor Paul Robinson? Against. Councillor uh, Bernie Swift? Against. Councillor Eric Thompson? Against. I, myself, before. Councillor Victor Warrington? For. Councillor Bert Wilson? Councillor Bert Wilson? You're muted. Councillor Wilson? Four. Okay. We go back in a couple of those there. Uh, Councillor Chris McCaffrey. Councillor Stephen McCann. And Councillor Alan Rainey. Okay, I'm getting no response from any of those three. So the totals are 11 for and 21 against. Uh, so uh, really that's left the, the other proposal, which is uh, Councillor Dehan, and uh, seconded by Councillor McGuire. And I'm accepting that, except of any dissent, it's a reverse of the last vote. And in other words, that we're voting for hybrid uh, meetings. Is there anybody to sense from that assumption? Yes. Who said yes? Uh, I'm dissenting, Councillor Irvine. Councillor Irvine, okay, then we will go for a further vote. And this so, is. Sorry, on... sorry, Chair, sorry, Chair, just to clarify there, you, you asked for dissent. To, to, okay. to, to your proposal there that, that the, the, the vote was the opposite of, and Councillor Irvin came in again there, so surely, uh, you know. You're quite, you're quite right. In fact, though, it has to be that situation. Is it necessary to go through a vote again? That's what I'm... I, I think it's a, direct, a conflict between the, the, the two, which we had got consensus on. So I'll agree with you, but we'll note, note the, the dissent from uh, Councillor Irvine. Celine, Chair. you wish to make a comment? You're muted. Chair, the other item is to consider then the effective date for for this. Do do we wish to uh, make arrangements then for meetings with effect from October, with uh, members attending in in person? Then either we have to make a decision as to whether two meters or one meter social distancing is is appropriate. Uh, that will then dictate how many can. Be accommodated and then we probably do need to have some uh, discussion on whether that would be on a first come first served basis as to who who's accommodated in and secondly or or whether it is on uh, some form of proportionality those those are our two practical options that we can yeah there was one other question which was asked by councillor coffee with regard to the hybrid meetings of the could you answer yes, that? Yes, I, I certainly oh, can. Yes, um, Councillor Coffey um, raised the issue about whether the hybrid meetings would be live streamed, and that's dealt with in one point, paragraph 1.3 of the report because we have invested in the ICT equipment, which will uh, facilitate the ongoing live streaming of in chamber and hybrid meetings. Um, I just out of curiosity I checked and I think there was six watching this meeting. Um I, I and that I do know that includes um maybe at least one, maybe two officers. Um I myself tuned in last night to the regeneration and community meeting as one of the internet and uh, users and there was four at that stage. However, I would say there's been hundred and nineteen views in total of the of last night's meeting, which again would include officers going back to check details and uh and and indeed maybe councillors as well but that just gives a, a picture of of how the um you know how the the extent of of use of that the other question that councillor coffee posed was um i suppose it's, it's really about the um how 
the in-chamber and the hybrid speaking rights would be managed and there would be some element of the chair's discretion there, which would be similar. Um, I suppose it, it is not physically or technologically possible to merge someone indicating by pressing a button, a light in, in the chamber, and then also someone pressing a hand on the uh, on the on the virtual system so the chair would have to use some discretion there whether they would alternate or what they would decide to do in terms of speaking orders um that that's one that there there is no technological answer to that one that it would just have to be managed as part of the meeting okay uh, now with regard to the start date uh, council green Uh, Councillor Patrick Ian Kelly. Hand is up in air, hired. Okay, no problem. Councillor Robert Irvine. Yes. Look, we're, we're coming into autumn and winter. Um, members who have had double jabs are probably going to be faced with um, the offer of a flu jab if they're over a certain age and a possible booster. Um, the variants are still around there and the transmission rates are still high. Um, the issue of social distancing uh, under consideration by Stormont is still up in the air, whether it's two metres uh, down to one metre. Um, I honestly believe that we should wait until Christmas time before we actually implement uh, this decision. The decision's taken, uh, okay, but I think we're going into a period of flux. And what I wouldn't like to see is we set up a meeting in a month, uh, two months time, and then suddenly the whole thing changes again, and we have to revert back to the, um, the virtual. I think we're going into a period where we need to reflect, look at the actual current health situation, take our leadership from that, and then go with the option of starting, say, in January. Uh, that would be my proposal. Okay, thank you, Councillor Irving. Councillor Mary Garty. Uh, thank you, Chairman um, and Howard and members. We can see that this is a, a personal um, position that many members will feel on this, not a party group necessarily, and that has to be respected because many have different views on it, and I certainly respect it. However, I think all of us have been to religious venues recently, sporting venues recently, or maybe restaurant venues recently, to name a few. We also have our children back in school in large classrooms and subject to a lot of stuff. So I think we have to make an effort, um, as other members did, to try and move back to normality as best we can, notwithstanding the very relevant points that Robert made and the concerns he has, which I know is genuine. But the hybrid method gives us allows us to both options if you are in any way fearful um, that you can stay at home or come in. So therefore, Chair, I will just throw it out there and uh, say if it's not the wishes of the members, no harm done. I would go for one metre social distancing and start the this new system starting in the first council meeting of next month, October. And I make that as a proposal if there is anyone who wishes to second it. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, uh, Councillor Garrity. Councillor Warrington. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I know everybody's going to have mixing views on this. Uh, one thing which I think will cause problems, uh, and Celine highlights it there to a degree, um, if you have uh, X amount of, of councillors in the chamber and another X amount on, on hybrid, um, is it going to be a situation, uh, you know, that, that has to be at the Chair's discretion? Is it a situation, if this is passed and we're going to go down this road, that the people that the councillors that are in the chamber use their surface pros the same way as we do when we're at home only obviously with headphones uh because at the end of the day at least then um they're going to be equal whenever they want to speak at least when they put their hand up it's going to the chair is going to see it uh in real time as apart from a person sitting at home putting their hand up and a person within the chamber Preston okay. uh, to speak. I think th th that would obviously be a fair way. Uh, personally, um, I, I think we're mad going back into the chamber, uh, rushing back into it. 
uh, especially when the virtual meetings are working not too bad. Um, but I, 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 I'm obviously happy enough to go with the the uh, majority. But I, that certainly would be my views. But the decision is made for hybrid meetings. What we're actually discussing here now is the time that it starts. And Councillor Garrity has recommended one metre distance October. Councillor Irvine has talked about sure. New Year uh, for hybrid meetings. Next one is Councillor Wilson. I'll let the chief executive come in to clarify an issue. Yeah, Chair, it's it's just one minor point, just in terms of Councillor Garrity's proposal. Um, the current guidance from the executive is two metres within the workplace, and the council venues uh, would be classified as workplaces. Now, obviously, there is some speculation that that is likely to change, but it may be in those circumstances more appropriate just to reference the current guidance, but uh, as long as it would de be defined as a workplace, we would be required to uh, meet the the, st the Stormont guidance in that regard. Chair, Chair can you hear me now? Hold on a wee sec, we're just clarifying. Yeah, just, 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 just checking. Yeah. yeah, just hold there, please. Uh, Councillor Garty, are you happy to change us according to the advice of the Chief Executive? Um, Chairman, no, I'm not because of the reasons I, I, um, I outlined earlier. However, I respect the chief executive position and the position that we would find ourselves in as public representatives. A lot of what those people have given us as guidelines, I have disagreed with. So uh, I will happily um, agree to the two metre ones because of what Alison's guidance, but it wouldn't make me happy to change. But if that would make our, our our system run better and for the good of the council, I don't want to get any councillors into trouble or be soon set in a bad example. But it's not the direction that I normally have great credence in because they're very mixed messages from that executive, okay. and I think we all agree with that. Okay, so, I, I two mean, meters, I, two meters. Yeah. I, I I don't think uh, the the chief executive was saying two meters. It was current uh, guidance, you know, rather than putting it to one or two. It may change the week after or whatever. Is is that okay? Yeah, well, that's exactly okay, Chair. That could change in the next two hours. Yep. What they're uh, like, but what I'm saying course. is, I don't agree with them. But I okay. look the current guidelines and the Chief Executive's directive on that, and therefore I'll happily go two meters in October. Because if we are going to start this hybrid, there's no point sitting about. We may just do it. We're putting other people out in, in front okay. of our own services. And I think okay, we I have a lot of ones to come in here. Hour. Thank you for that. Yeah. That's okay. Okay. Thank you, Wilson. Yes, Chair. I would just like to ask our financial officer. Uh, I would think that we should have, if we, we uh, at present would, uh, I would like to know what the month of savings and uh, mining sorry, would be, Chair, because I think that would be. Yeah, sorry, know Bert, what The decision yeah. has been made. Uh, yes, so I know, but I would, I would like to know. I would just like to know what saving it would have made. Okay, that's fine, but we're dealing with this particular issue when the hybrid meeting starts, so that's what I want to, to keep to. Uh, has anybody that's looking to speak any difference from uh, the view of Councillor Irvine or Councillor Garrity? Is there anybody, please speak out if you have a different viewpoint from what the two have proposed? I think that then it'd be better. Chair, uh, can, uh, some of coffee. us haven't maybe made our mind up on things, so we're requiring further uh, information. Right. I think we, we, we sort of are in receipt of as much information as we can get. Uh, I think it's a simple matter. And if an sure. individual. Uh, just ask sorry, a Hold on, Donald. Hold on. Okay. Just, just hold on, please. I'm trying to give as much a, a latitude here because it involves everybody. I, I think we're coming up with two conclusions. Now, with regard to the decision whether you attend a meeting or not on the hybrid system is a personal one. And uh, so all we're doing is setting the, the, the shall we say, the, 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 what can happen if the member wishes it to happen, and that is if we have enough spaces to accommodate those who wish to be in the meeting. So I think we, we all watch the news. We all know what's happening. So it's down to that. We've decided it's hybrid meetings. 
The time of that is what we're trying to decide now. If we haven't any different from starting in October, uh, with obviously the accepted uh, distances. Sure. And the other one was with regard to Councillor Irvine of leaving it until after Christmas. Now, if there's anybody with any different to that, please let me know now, please. Chair, I, I, I just want to have an answer because uh, it's not simply about our personal uh, dispositions, it's about what, what's best for the corporate body. And, and, and the question the councillor uh, has been raised there, I think it was by Bertie, uh, uh, around the savings in terms of expenses is of very relevant material interest in making this decision. So I'd like to hear that first, Chair. Thank you. Celine, I'm not sure whether you're in a position to. Uh, Chair, I, I can make an estimation of it. Um, to June of, of this year, the members' allowances were 17,000 underspent. But if we're talking about somewhere between 14 and 19 members coming in to, to the chamber, um, traveling, say, an average of 50 miles, um, the cost of, of that would be in the region of five to six hundred pounds. If we're talking about an increased number of members, you could proportionately adjust that. Um, you know, there's just a, a broad set of assumptions. Um, so the travel cost of, of running one of those meetings would be between five and six hundred pounds. Um, there's just one other point, Chair, whenever I'm on. It's Councillor Warrington's point around everyone um, using the Surface Pros. We have looked at that from a technical point of view as well. Um, we do have some concerns about how many people we can have working in the one room together and not get feedback echo. You, you see that we do have that from time to time. So it's you know, whether we may have to look if that was the way members wish to proceed about using maybe different rooms in, in the one building, um, but that, that does call, if, which then takes away from being in the chamber really. So um, that, that is the issue there that, you know, it's really in chamber is, is, to, is similar to what members would have been used to previously then with the members joining on screens. And it is fair to say that there are other organisations, other um, you know, decision making um, governmental bodies that and, and indeed other councils who, who are working through these processes. One particular difference for our council remains the fact that we have full member committees. Um, most of the other councils that are, are operating their committee structure on reduced numbers are having those meetings in person um, or indeed then are, are bringing in hybrids. And, and I mean, that's working quite well for us as well in respect of the planning committee. Just a few other observations. Okay, thank you, Celine. Councillor Dehan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I would be happy to uh, second Councillor Garrity's uh, okay. proposal, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Green. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, sometimes the, this conversation, I have to get a laugh myself. Just uh, size of the pension chamber and then the skin uh, is about five times bigger than my school bus. I sit five or six hours a day with 50 people behind me, uh, uh, politicians. Okay, I mean, well, we're trying to work to government guidance here and I understand what you're saying. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you for letting me in again, Chairman. Just a very quick, uh, very quick question, and I know what uh, Councillor Gardy had proposed. Uh, I was generally happy enough with that, but I, I take on board what the chief, chief executive has advised. What the current, the current guidance is, not regulations guidance, and uh, that is obviously subject to change. Uh, well, is there? Will it be allowed within that if we can change? The guidance uh, to suit our own council, as has been dictated to uh, by uh, by Stormont Bet uh, between now and December. Chair, maybe just to to um, to comment on it. I suppose as I think has been alluded in in many uh, of the contributions this evening, the executive is meeting on quite a frequent basis in terms of COVID matters. We had previously understood that there may have been a decision 
on reducing social distancing uh, at the start of September. Obviously, that didn't materialise. So yes, uh, certainly as I would interpret it, Councillor Thompson, the Councillor Garrity's proposal as it now is, is that we would proceed, to, we would obviously acknowledge Councillor Garrity's wish to proceed to one metre social distancing, but we would be required as a workplace to adhere to the executive guidance. We'd obviously do a risk assessment on, on all of our venues uh, and that would be the basis. So if the executive issued, for example, revised guidance next next week and reduced it to one metre in workplaces for social distancing, then that is the basis on which we would be proceeding. Thank you for the clarification, uh, Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. Okay, just to, we, 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 we have more speakers here, but I think we're, we're, a, we're um, sort of more or less two options available. A, with the first of which was, uh, which Chief Executive? We proceed. Councillor Garrity, and that was seconded. Councillor Dehan. So we're going to put that uh, to the vote first of all. And I think rather than trying to start it with with hands, I'm going to have to take a uh, rec Can I call a recorded vote for that one? Yeah, that's, 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 that's no problem. Uh, every, everybody take their hands down, and we go straight to a vote. And this is for uh, Councillor Garrity's, and that is with current advice starting in. in October. Councillor Diane Armstrong. Against. Councillor Alec Baird. Against. Uh, Councillor Matthew Bell is not present. Councillor Paul Blake. For Chair. Councillor Mark Buchanan. Against. Uh, Councillor Glenn Campbell. Baver for. Uh, Councillor Sean Clark. Sean not present. Councillor John Coyle. For. Uh, Councillor Curry. John. Dave Aber. For. For. Councillor Josephine Deacon. For, Chair. Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Dave Aber. For. Councillor Sean Donnelly. For. Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Against. Councillor Keith Elliott. Against. Councillor Deborah Erskine, not present. Councillor Anthony Feely? For. Councillor Anne Marie Fitzgerald? Not present. Councillor Adam Gannon's not present. Councillor Mary Garty? For, Chair. Okay, Councillor Seamus Green? For. For, okay. Councillor Robert Irvine? Against. Okay. Councillor Eamon Keenan? Against. Councillor Catherine Kelly. Four. Councillor Padraigine Kelly. Four. Councillor Tommy Maguire. The high four. Councillor Evan McAleer. Against. Councillor Chris McCaffrey. Present. Councillor Steve McCann. Go on. Yeah. Councillor John McLaughlin. That's okay. Uh, against, for, against, sorry, correction. You're against Councillor Gardies, yeah. Yes, sorry. Uh, Councillor Michael Duff's not present. Councillor Gordon McPhillips. For, Chair. For. Councillor Donald O'Coffey. Against. Councillor Thomas O'Reilly. For. Councillor Alan Rainey. Against. Against. Councillor Paul Robinson. Against. Councillor Bernice Swift. For. Councillor Earl Thompson. For. Uh, myself, against. Councillor Victor Warrington. Against. Councillor Bert Wilson. Councillor Bert Wilson. I think he's left. Left. Okay, so we'll add that up. Seventeen fourteen. Okay, members, say uh, there's seventeen four and fourteen against. So there will be hybrid me meetings, uh, starting in October, subject to any uh, 
directions imposed upon us. Okay, so uh, obviously further details will be forwarded out at a later stage through uh, Celine. Okay, that's that matter. That was, I thank everybody for their participation in that because it's a very, very important issue. Uh, and obviously, it would be looked upon as to uh, guidance from, from ourselves as to what others may do. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on now to. Hi, Chair, I have my hand up there. Sorry, Councillor McLaughlin. Sorry, there's still one outstanding issue. Uh, we haven't decided what happens if there's the meetings are oversubscribed, how, how we resolve who attends and who doesn't. Okay, you're quite right. I suppose we go for the hunt. Uh, obviously, that, that would be the only fair way to do it, but uh, rather than first come, first served. Okay, that's a proposal, Councillor Garrity. I'm happy to take officers' direction on that, Chair, but just maybe if it is any use, contact the Trone County Board and how they allocated the tickets, because I know it is a similar thing. So let's see who the lucky recipients are to attend the council meeting. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Donald Coffey. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm I'm very concerned with the prospect now that uh, voices such as uh, the independents and single entry parties are going to be hugely discriminated against in terms of participation, um, because the Hunt system is is geared really for those with multiple representations, and and it gives added weight to those who have more elected weight. And the reality is, if if we restrict it, say, to a two meter okay. social distancing, the likelihood is that uh, very few representatives will be able to attend uh, from outside the, the parties. Thank you, Chair. OK, I'm going to ask Alison to comment on that, yeah. please. Chair, I suppose, well, two things. Firstly, to the best of my knowledge, the independents have largely, with the exception maybe of one or two members, voted to operate entirely remotely. But I suppose <laughs> the, the practical reality we have, Chair, is that we will have constrained space. We have no idea of what the expressions of interest for that space is. Uh, Personally, I would think it is unlikely that we will be oversubscribed based on members' own comments and the, the fact that we're heading into the autumn and winter period. But we do have to make provision that currently we can only accommodate a limited number of members in either chamber on a two meter basis. Uh, from an officer perspective, we can accommodate either. But I think the, the uh, worst scenario would be that we are holding spaces for people who then do not come to the chamber. Um, and I think, I mean, if it's a case, Chair, that members may wish to give some further consideration to the logistics or indeed if we seek an expression of interest, perhaps, for the October Council and Environmental Services Committee to see the, the level of interest for people wishing to attend in person, um, I, th that should clarify matters. I think the other thing, Chair, just to, to correct is that all 40 members will continue to have equal access to all aspects of the meeting and it is both inaccurate and disingenuous to suggest otherwise. Okay, I mean, you know, we have more speakers on this. Uh, and a bunch have spoken, if you could take your hand down, please. Uh, Councillor McLaughlin, you've already spoken. Councillor Warrington. Chair, can I come back in just on that? Because there was a few comments there from the Chief I'll, Executive. I'll come back to you, yeah. I'll come back to you, Donald. Uh, Councillor Warrington, you're next. Yeah, member. I would just like to come in uh, and second Councillor McLaughlin's proposal. Thank you. Councillor McGuire. Uh, Gorm, I'm going to well, uh, uh, Chief Executive has, has thankfully said some of the things that I was going to say. First of all, in relation to the number of members who have clearly indicated the wish to remain on the in the in the virtual world, and obviously, once you take them out of the the numbers, uh, I don't think that problem will arise. Uh, the further remark then about disenfranchised and independence, etc. Like the, this, this is a nonsense thing. It's it's. It keeps coming up. It's a bit like the accusation that the hunt, when it's applied, is not a democratic method. When just because it doesn't suit some minor parties in the in the group, although it's accepted for over twenty five years across here. So, uh, it, it just I'm glad that the chief executive said what she said there. That uh, there's obviously members that don't wish to attend. And if I could just remind members, and there are members who have voted against this, are members of Nilga. And Nilga already has held uh, at least a couple of hybrid meetings. And in fact, some of the people that voted against the physical meeting were present at those meetings. I note. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, we're not going to get into arguments about the way people have voted. We're, we're trying to make compromise here and to move things forward. Uh, 
Councillor O'Coffey, I've said I would let you in briefly. Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, it's just two two issues, and it's uh, doubly unfortunate at this stage because uh, what the the chief executive, uh, I don't think this is what she meant, but uh, what it was intimated was that we, uh, those of us who had voted one way, uh, necessarily had did so uh, done so because we did not wish to attend. Uh, I actually was voting on behalf of those who I felt. Uh, shouldn't be put into that position. That's truly, and, okay. and also the savings to the council. And unfortunately, that was leapt upon then by Councillor Maguire. So uh, the, the, that's a double uh, problem. But I also We're have not to say, leaping upon anybody here. Well, We're trying to uh, get. It's unfortunate this. that this is what happens to, to those. Uh, but uh, again, the issue is really around De Hunt. De Hunt is, as I've stated, a system which is uh, uh, affords the greater priority and representation at the I, earliest stages to the larger parties, as we all know. I, I, and if I, this is limited, then some of us may effectively be outside. And then the issue I, has been raised repeatedly around how do you know who's speaking when and where will be at the discretion of the chair. And that's when a lot of concerns will be raised, I'm sure, with many of uh, like myself. Thank you. I think the point has been made. Councillor McAleer, very, very briefly. Thanks, nice, Chair. No, just in response to some of the some of the comments that have been made, the fact that some speakers are are quite happy to try and force people back into the workplace and dis dismiss the current guidance, the medical and scientific guidance about social. No, I, I, I can't let this go on but because the, chair, decisions, the decisions have already been made. Chair, I, I in terms of in terms of the actual result, I I have to say the idea that we don't have a formal process now for deciding who speaks and in what order that has a serious impact in terms I'm sorry of but the council has made second. decisions here and, chair, and, and, it, has a, it has a serious impact on the, the democracy discretion. of the council sorry it's at the chair's discretion and oh, i mean so. that, that is our standing orders and no I'm, I'm not taking any more than this it's we're trying to make decisions here. We've sure, sure, one final point then on a no final point. I have a proposal. No, Councillor McAleer, don't over talk me. Please do not over talk me. Thank you, Chair. We've had a proposal and we've had a seconder that it's sorted out by the haunt. Uh, anybody in disagreement with that? Please raise their hand. Councillor Coffey, Councillor McAleer, Councillor Keenan, and Councillor Swift. Councillor Donnelly. Can't see Councillor Keenan. Stephen Donnelly. Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Okay, so that is passed. So that is the that topic cleared up. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is 6.5 to consider a report on staff matters, paper K. And just before you, I put hand over to Celine. I'm very glad to see that there's a couple of articles actually in the last appendix there about our own staff, uh, about the staff hub, and about Florence Willis in that publication. So I'll hand you over to Celine. Thank you. Chair, in the staffing report, there's one item for decision making, which is just to confirm the council's Christmas closure arrangements, and then there's a number of items for information. Um, We've we've provided just an update on, uh, I suppose, our COVID statistics, which is since the last report of further 21 employees have tested positive. Um, an interesting fact is, uh, or is that there has been no workplace transmission. So that does um, give us some encouragement of the the risk assessment and the procedures um, that that we are, are taking have been effective. Uh, sorry, with one exception, and in that particular case, um, the procedures were to being followed and social distancing arrangements that had been put in place were um had had not been expressly hadn't been followed so um whilst you can appreciate that that is very disruptive to services um we are working through and following the guidance and, and managing the situation and we would we would intend to continue in that vein so the Recommendations are set out at point nine on page three. Uh, the council approves Christmas closure arrangements, notes the update on COVID-19, the local government training group contribution and the triennial 
Covenant assessment exercise in respect of our pension scheme and an update on the local government pay issues and also then the staff newsletter and the uh, local government staff commission easing that you've noted includes some um, council related articles. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Celine. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much uh, again, Chairman. Uh, thanks, Celine, for the report. Uh, I'll, I'll take uh, on board what you had said about uh, Florence Willis. Congratulations again to her and everything that's on that report. I'm happy enough to propose all the recommendations as listed, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Robinson. I second that. Okay, you've heard it proposed and seconded. Uh, uh, any dissenters from that? Are we all in agreement? Councillor McAleer, are you dissenting? No, the chair was just one very brief comment that uh, Make it very brief, noted, please. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It was noted there that there's uh, nowhere one workplace transmission. Um, if we move now to one meter distance and in the chamber, uh, it'll be interesting just to note how that proceeds uh, over the coming months. So we haven't made a decision on one meter. It's current guidelines at that time. Hey, uh, Councillor Irvine, briefly. Yeah, it, it's been proposed and seconded uh, with the recommendations. Is that right, Chair? Under 2.2, we're seeking nominations. Oh, correct. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Apologies. Absolutely. Uh, under 3.1, I think um, there's an issue on 3.3. We need nominations for um, the NILGA. I think that's the next report, Chair. The next report? Yeah. Yeah. But 2.2, yeah. I think you need nominations. Correct. There are, you're quite, quite right on that, Councillor Irvine. Yeah. Celine, can you highlight that, please? No, it's the next report, Chair. Oh, next report. There's no 2.2 in paper K, agenda item 6.5. Um, I think the next paper oh, is the director's six. report, yeah. which is 6.6 yeah. 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 paper L. My apologies. Yeah. My apologies. Yep. Yeah. He actually managed to get me confused there too. See, so it thanks, well, Councillor yeah, Irvine. That must be one up for me then, Chair. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we've had it proposed and seconded. I all agreed. Okay, we move on now to the director's report six point six, which has been referred to there, Celine. So, Chair, members, um, three items for decision making in uh, in this paper, item 6.6 .6 on the agenda, which is just a, a number of general items. An update amendment to the mobile telephone and data device policy for elected members and the associated ICT policy, um, the copy of which is at Appendix 1 and 2. Um, information then about the uh, Assam Association uh, commemoration event on the uh, from the 18th to the 21st of November, of which nominations would be sought, and then approval of the Nuclear Free Local Authorities annual membership fee of £867. The report then continues with um, information matters for noting. Um, the first one is uh, the request to uh, from a previous action to bring back information on the options for a rainbow crossing and, and the relevant information, which is set out at 3.1. Uh, just further advice on the NILGA um, elected member charter award. Uh, and then the uh, NILGA local government annual conference event on the 24th of November, which is taking both in-person and virtual um, attendees. And then for information as well, the NILGA regional program for September 21 through to April 22. Recommendations are set out in section nine. Um, and uh, as, as the members previously stated, we do, uh, it, it would require any nominations for item two and then also for item six um albeit that item six is is a little bit of time away and and we could seek um members to submit nominations say by the 20th of september for for that one they could be ratified at council okay council coffee yeah thank you chair uh i'm happy to to first of all note uh the the, the report um i wanted to really uh, speak on the issue there under uh 3.1 uh one one two one three um it's in relation to the uh pride uh crossing and i i think that we had a very uh good discussion on this the last time and i think uh 
we we should certainly see this brought forward. So I'd like to propose um, that uh, perhaps the uh, if if it's for Inniskillen and Oma that uh, maybe it's at an appropriate meeting of Inniskillen councillors and uh, Oma councillors, if if that would be useful and acceptable to all, that uh, we would decide upon locations to take forward uh, a, a, a pride crossing uh, in 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 a, in the in the two towns. And indeed, I think the the the, the guidance and the, the information provided clarifies that uh, it is indeed possible to do so at areas where uh, there is uh, an, an not a zebra crossing, but a, a, a you know signal control crossing. So there's a list of those at uh, Appendix Five. I I would probably have my own preferences, but I think it possibly should be something that we uh, collectively would agree as as councillors representing the DEA. So that's my proposal. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so I'm just trying to check here, uh, Chief Executive. It was proposed that it was investigated. Was it proposed that it would be going to both lines? Oh yes, sorry. The fee, the proposal, the previous council proposal, Chair, was that the feasibility uh, be presented to the the council, and then in that original proposal, it was the feasibility for both towns, which is why the set the list of locations uh, across the the district has been referenced in the okay. report. No, it's just clarification. Okay, Councillor Baird. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'd like to speak on the issue of the centenary commemoration, the opening of the Ulster Tower. Um, th this issue came before the other councils across Northern Ireland several months ago. Um, for some reason, it didn't reach us uh, in Fermanagh, Oma. Um, it was brought to my attention, so I asked that it be raised on the agenda tonight. I think this is an issue that, that can unite us right across the, the, the spectrum of the council, because the, the, the purpose of this event is uh, that November 21 marks the centenary of the opening of the Ulster Tower on the Somme battlefields, a memorial commemorating the service and sacrifice of men from the island of Ireland at the Somme and the wider First World War. And if you look down through the itinerary, itinerary there, it looks at the activities of the 16th Irish and the 36th Ulster Division. So all the men from Ireland uh, and this, there's a visit to the uh, Island of Ireland Peace Tower as well. So I commend this to the council. I propose that uh, we send representatives to this. And I would suggest uh, what we do is what we did in previous uh, uh, commemorations uh, in the June Somme celebrations, that we send five, one from each party and one from the independents and solo groupings. So that would be my proposal. Okay, and next one in, Councillor Irvine. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm I'm going to go to the main recommendations because I've already talked about it. Um, I'm happy to propose the approval of recommendation one, two, and three. And recommendation two is really backing up what Councillor Baird has said uh, in regard to the Ulster Tower. Um, I would agree with that. The other four items is down here for noting. Um, I think item six should be approved and we should make nominations to Nilga Conference. I do not agree with Councillor um, O'Coffey in that we proceed uh, on item four with the Rainbow Crossings. There is a cost attaching which equates to nearly £40,000 for the two crossings. Um, this was um, brought before us for information and for options going forward. Uh, I disagree with spending the money on that. If the money can be sourced from another uh, source, then we can facilitate it. But I disagree with actually taking it out of council budgets to actually do it. So I would not approve that. I will only note those other items. Thank you. That's my proposal. Okay. Uh, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, in direct reference to the previous speaker there, um, there was a message posted a couple of days ago on the Oma Pride page from Julianne Cor Johnson, who describes herself as a North Belfast Ulster Unionist. So I'm sure she would be very disappointed in his yes, comments. Keep to, keep to the point I'm, here. Please. I'm happy to to second Councillor O'Coffey's comments, and I'd spoken or had been in contact with uh, some of the directors in relation to this uh, item, just following uh, us passing that proposal at a previous meeting. 
uh, councillors will be aware that the 25th of September, so 10 days time, is the Oma Pride Festival. And I would be hoping that there would have been something, or I would have been hopeful that there would have been something in place prior to that. I believe the event is taking place at Southwest College. Now, members are aware that I'm a member of staff on Southwest College. Okay. I'm wondering in relation keep to, to, the, to the agenda, please. In, re, in relation to the proposal uh, in place, which I'm I'm happy to second from Councillor Coffee, would there be a facility there to accommodate a temporary uh, rainbow crossing or rainbow design between the council and Southwest College uh, that could be arranged? Obviously, being mindful of the the fees or the costing that's uh, that's noted within the report. So, uh, uh, if I'm not conflicted, okay. I would like to make uh, a proposal. I'm going to bring in the chief executive on that point. Uh, Chair, I, I suppose what I would just say in response to uh, Councillor McAleer, it really would be a matter for Southwest College to be their property. I can also say the, the organisers of Pride, I mean, clearly the council does have a grant aid programme, but we have received no application, so there would be no mechanism by which we would be in a position to provide financial support. Um, they came to us at the very start just around guidance on the 11 bar 1 forms and route and so on, but but that's been the extent of the uh, queries that we have received for, from the organisers. So no councillor, that that wouldn't be something that's feasible within the time scale unless Southwest College were able to progress it on their own property. Thanks. For okay. that. Uh, we ne next have councillor Eamon Keenan. Sorry, Chair, could I just respond to that? Uh, no, I'm not looking for a response. You've seconded Councillor O'Coffey. We'll move on. Just to Councilor say that we've Keenan. saved the money by meeting remotely, so I'm happy that... to second the proposal. You have already done that. Councillor Keenan. Yeah, well, I was going to mention that very point. Uh, I'd support Donald's call to proceed with the Rainbow Crossing. And as Celine pointed out, we've saved thousands for meeting rem remotely, so it's a cost we could probably incur. Okay, but, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McGuire. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Gurumagan. Thank you. Uh, a few items here. Uh, if, if I could address the proposal by Councillor Baird in relation to the, the trip to the uh, organised trip by the Ledger Holidays, which is a strange way to present the information, but uh, uh, on, on Alex's uh, proposal of sending five members at a cost of £550 a police plus mileage, uh, I think that is a bit exorbitant. Uh, I am quite happy to concede that uh, and make the proposal that our chair, if he so wishes to attend this, would be the best person to go forward to represent this district. And I, I say if he so wishes, obviously, with the proviso, if it was a different chair, he may not choose to go to it. So uh, on that, I'd propose that the chair should uh, have the option to go with the support of the council. And uh, in relation to the Rainbow Cross, I'm quite happy to support that. In relation to the NILGA conference, uh, I, I need clarification on how many members we have on the NILGA executive, but if I could propose that the NILGA executive members uh, would automatically be allowed to go to that conference. Uh, if I could have just the number, the total number we have, please, Chair. That's all I have to say on my issues. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. I've been told four. Councillor McGuire, four. Right. Uh, if I could propose those four, uh, it'd be automatically accepted. And uh, obviously, yes, myself as the partnership panel representative, I may consider it, but I, I hadn't thought of it. So uh, if if I could propose those four and uh, leave the other two places for a, a, a later confirmation. Is that, Debrona? Sorry about that. Okay, Councillor Feely. Yeah, thank you. No, just second um Councillor proposals that. Okay, we're getting very close to our three hour limit. Uh, I I we have started this topic, so I'll try and finish as quickly as I can. Uh, there's obviously differences of opinion. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a difference of opinion in recommendation one and recommendation three. That's under a uh, the uh, the recommendations there. Is there any dissenters to those two recommendations which were made by Councillor Irvine? Could we please take our hands down? 
I assume there's no dissenters, so we have passed the recommendation one and we've gotten past the recommendation three. With regard to recommendation two, uh, we, we've had uh, proposals from uh, Councillor Baird, which I think was seconded. No, it wasn't seconded. Have we a seconder for Councillor Baird? Councillor Irvine. Councillor Irvine, okay, for five. And from Councillor McGuire, which had been seconded for one. So we're going to have to make a decision there and that one would be the chairman of the council uh, or a deputy or whatever. Okay, so we're in conflict on that one. So I'm going to ask a more or less the first proposal, full proposal, was Councillor McGuire. So we'll put Councillor McGuire's to the uh, vote. I'll try and do a hands up here. Chair, can uh, you con uh, confirm, just confirm Councillor McGuire's proposal again? Thank you. Councillor McGuire's proposal is the chair of the council, or perhaps a deputy would represent this council at this event. Chair. And what's the alternative? Chairman. Chair yeah. Sorry, uh, do you want clarification there, Ray? Councillor McGuire? Chairman. Alan, no, sorry. Councillor Rennie here. There, sorry, uh, Councillor Rennie. I am one of the council nominees to the SOM Association. I definitely have an interest. Uh, Chair. Chair. Hold on, Sorry. please, please. I think, first of all, I think I, I'm getting to the stage where I need to actually uh, suspend and uh, get the extra half hour. That is, if I consider we can get through the rest of the business. And I do think that it, with a bit of help, we we can get through the rest of the business. What do you consider, Alison? Okay, so I'm looking for a proposer or seconder to suspend standing orders for the half hour. Can I get a proposal Second, probably for that? Proposed chair. Second chair. Okay, we got notes there. Proposer seconder. Okay, so we're carrying on for half an hour, hopefully to get things cleared up. Now, a basically the proposal is there's there's two proposals, five from Councillor Baird, but the first proposal was that the chair, or I. Uh, Sorry, chair. If yeah. you would allow me maybe to, to adjust my proposal accordingly. Okay. Uh, uh, in light of in light of what Councillor Rainey has indicated that he is uh, the nomination to that particular organization. Uh, if I could adjust my uh, proposal that the chair and the SOM representative okay. committed to attend, would that facilitate the meeting? I I, I Councillor uh, Rainey. Hey, uh, what's your view on that? Councillor Rennie? Okay, we we have two different. Did, uh, you want me to come in here? Cars. Did you want me to come in here, Chair? Uh, yes, I mean the the, uh, the Councillor McGuire's changed to the Chair and yourself as the Council representative on the Psalm. Uh, he's well, I do really appreciate that because okay. it's my intention to go anyway. Okay, one right. way or another. Okay, well, we're going to quickly get down to a vote here, and sure. uh, so we're we're voting on Councillor McGuire's and seconded by Councillor Feely. So, and that is that, with regard to this recommendation to that, it's only the chair and the representative of the council and so on and committee. Can I just clarify the situation? Sorry, I, I thought it clarified. We're only talking about no, no, no. two here. No, well, and, uh, I just want to clarify the position with regard to the membership of the SOM uh, Association and as Councillor Alan Rene MBE and myself. Correct. So, you know, that's Councillor McGuire's recommendation. I'm aware, aware of that. No, sorry, I, I thought he, he was quite, quite compromising there to actually not only the chair of the council, but to include Councillor Rainey as the representative. Is that clear to everyone? 
Yeah, we are both representatives of that. I just happen to be the chair of the council this year. Chair. Two okay, sorry, I picked that up wrong, but okay. So we have a rep a, a recommendation from Councillor McGuire. Anybody dissenting from that or recommendation to could you please raise your hands? Councillor Garrity. Sorry, Chair, and I just wanted in uh, on, on a point of information that I attended a trip there a couple of years back. And yeah, I have a time, and, honestly, so for this I meeting. Just wanted to say, Chair, that. I think Councillor, I think it was Bear's proposal, may have resulted in maybe just one more interested party. Oh. Uh, I think members would have the uh, right not to go, and some may not wish to attend, but I know I certainly took a lot out of it and come away with it. So okay. I think it's a pity. I think there might be one more member that would be interested, but I'm happy to go with the way of the meeting. Thank you, Chair. But it okay, was a very you. useful and, and, and enjoyable experience. Okay, thank you. I'm running short of time here now. So, um, so we have Councillor Baird, Councillor Irvine, Armstrong, McAleer. Hey, and myself against. So, so that chair, is, chair, just to clarify, this is to to send a number of members on a two members excursion for five hundred and fifty pound. Correct. Yeah. No. Um. Obviously. Okay. You're just that's fine. That. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that is. Sorry. Okay, keep your hand up in the meantime. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that is past eight and myself, sorry, nine dissenting. Okay. Right, members, we now have to go on to the uh, where the council notes. There's the information about the uh, rainbow crossings and so on. The update on the Nilga elected member development charter and the Nilga annual conference. Uh, the only debate there or different proposals was coming on the rainbow crossings. Is there any disagreement to the Nilga elected member development charter level? That's a uh, note five and note six and note seven. So we're dealing with note five, six, and seven. Is there anybody uh, uh, against or not willing to note those? Councillor Coffey. Sorry, Councillor Swift. Yeah, I can hear. Look, I would just say one thing about the virtual cost for the life of me. I, I, I never understand why there has to be such a tag price to a virtual attendance. I just would like to make that point, but I have no other big disagreements, Garamagat. Okay, so you propose noting the, the three of those. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Mr. Armstrong? Chair, Chair, happy to, to second uh, uh, Councillor uh, Swift's uh, noting. Okay. But just a quick, quick, um, quick word on the elected member development charter. Congratulations and good work done by all to Celine and her team. Um, for the NILGA conference, I would like to, if you're taking. Um, no, I think we forward nominations because I've only now 22 minutes left to fulfill the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so. Yeah, uh, with those at the council meeting, then we can... So we're going to deal now with the Rainbow Crossings, a uh, proposed and seconded. Uh, that was by Councillor O'Coffey. Seconded by Councillor McAleer. Councillor McAleer, that we put this to a uh, Enniskillen councillors and OMA councillors to uh, discuss and I, I agree some uh, location. And, the... and that would then be reported back to full council. And that is together with budgetary uh, outlets, uh, outlays for both. Is there anybody in disagreement with that proposal and seconding? No, not in disagreement with the chair, but just to express, uh, I would have interest and full support in the position of the councillors. Uh, and just because I'm from the town of Enniskillen or Oma, I would still be in support of, of the, the Pride Rainbow Crossing. Okay. Hey, so Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I know Councillor Irving had, had already alluded to it. There is a concern there with the costs with regard to uh, 
rainbow crossings in the two county towns of Oma and Anaskillen. And by that, I would be I would be against it. Well, I mean, at this stage, what we're talking about is it goes to the town councillors, uh, an agreed location, prices are sought, and then it comes back for a agreement or decision by council. I think that's the process that has been outlined. Uh, are you happy with that, Councillor Thompson? No, I, I, I'm against it, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Irvine. Um, I, I, I'm again, I, I'm not against getting it done, but I'm against actually the council being the promoter and the payer of it. So I'm obviously against this. Okay. Right. So we're we're going again. We have a uh, those who are for that course of action and those that are against. So I go back to. Councillor Coffey's recommendation, and we're going to vote on that. And that uh, is more or less that it is put to the Enniskillen and the Oma councillors to discuss the final location, get a price, and bring it back for agreement by the council. So I'm going to do this as quickly as possible, but I'm going to have to go down the names again. Recorded vote, Chair. Yes, uh, Councillor Armstrong. Councillor Armstrong? Against. Councillor Baird? For. Councillor Bell not here. Councillor Blake? Councillor Blake? Not present. Councillor Mark Buchanan? Against. Councillor Glenn Campbell? If I have her, for. Councillor Sean Clark? Not present. For. Oh, for, right. Councillor John Coyle? For. Councillor Siobhan Curry? If ever. For. Councillor Josephine Dehan? For, Chair. Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly? If ever. For. Councillor Sean Donnelly? For. Councillor Stephen Donnelly? For, Chair. Councillor Keith Elliott? Abstain. Okay, uh, Councillor Deborah Erskine not here. Councillor Anthony Feely? For. Councillor Anne Marie Fitzgerald? Present. Councillor Adam Gallum not present. Councillor Mary Gardy? For, Chair. Councillor Seamus Green? For. Councillor Robert Irvine? Against. Councillor Raymond Keenan? For. Councillor Catherine Kelly. Councillor Padrigan Kelly. Four, Chair. Councillor Tommy McGuire. The hey, four. Councillor Evan McAleer. Four. Councillor Chris McCaffrey, not presently. Councillor Steve McCann. Councillor John McLaughlin. Four. Councillor Barry Michael Duff not present. Councillor Garvin McPhillips? Four, Chair. Councillor Dublin O'Coffey? Four. Councillor Thomas O'Reilly? Four. Councillor Alan Rainey? Four. Was that four? Four. Okay. Councillor Paul Robinson? Against. Councillor Brittany East Swift? Four. Councillor L. Thompson? Against. Councillor Howard Thornton? For. Councillor Victor Warrington? Against. Councillor Bert Wilson? Gone. Okay, we're going to add up. Uh, 23, 6. 23, 4, 6 against, and 1 abstention. So it that is carried uh, that course of action. Okay, members. I uh, where are we now? Uh, so that is the director's report. Are we now moving on to eight three?
sorry. Seven one, I've got these. Oh, sorry. Seven one to approve, update report on a responsible procurement paper M. Celine. Good. Chair, it's for noting this report um, outlines the work that the Council has been doing in recent times in the whole area of responsible procurement. This stems from the policy um, that was approved by Council last October, and there's details of that at Appendix 1. Um, it also then sets out some examples of, of social value um, criteria that are included in in our tender documents and also I suppose the the key point here are included a scored um, assessment criteria and uh, this is ahead of any proposed legislation and, and we've recently had an announcement that there is um, a, a proposal for legislation in in the area of social value um, further to members requests previously there's also information at 2.4 around um, the the position on living wage um, requirements within tenders uh, other I suppose responsible procurement activities and then finally information about a supplier event that the council is hosting um, to encourage engagement with local suppliers um, as members will be aware whenever an advertisement is publicly advertised we we can't um, we can't mandate that it is local suppliers but we do try to encourage we provide training support so that they um, are have the the skills to uh, respond to public procurement uh, exercises and um, uh, we do then um, have these, uh, I mean, we've had a, this type of event before, this one will obviously be, be virtual. So that's a, a range of information, um, I suppose, more behind the scenes on the procurement processes and the recommendation is that the Council would note um, this information. Uh, members, this is for notation only. I think Celine spent some time at the last meeting talking about the ins and outs when asked. Uh, so I'm looking for a proposal to note and any questions can be forwarded to Celine because the timelines of this meeting are coming to a close very soon. So if you have any queries, if you would direct those directly to Celine, but I'm looking somebody to propose noting and a seconder. Councillor Coffey. Yeah, Chair, I'm, I'm happy to propose to note these, but I also have a proposal to make as well, uh, which is uh, uh, basically, um, I, this is very uh, inadequate in my honest opinion. Uh, as is noted in 2.4.3, the EU exit has now opened the door to us to pursue a much more proactive uh, role in terms of promoting the living wage. I, I don't agree that it uh, that sm local small businesses are disadvantaged because I think a lot of local small businesses and traders provide decent wages to their employees. So okay. I don't agree Pastoral with that coffee. bit. So oh, I think if we took a proposal, think... we would come back with because uh, uh, this requires and deserves truly more time. So I'd like to propose that be brought back with a view to how we can actually uh, enact greater uh, encouragement around the issue of living wage. Okay, uh, Thank uh, you. Coffee, perhaps if I ask if that we bring this paper back again, and that in the meantime you actually put your concerns to Celine to prepare for prepare paper for next meeting of a PNR. I'm so happy to okay. do that. My concerns are well known, but I'm certainly happy to do that. Thank you. Okay, can I get a seconder for that, please? Yeah, I'll second that, yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I'm very aware that, a, let me see, we're now, and a, there's no correspondence left, is there? Just one quickly, please, Alison. No, it's it's a repeat of eight point two is a repeat of the item that's been covered in the director's yeah, report. What item eight one chair is the correspondence from Causeway Coast and Glen seeking the council that support that regarding night? the it was it was covered over in regeneration and community, I oh, think. Yes, no, 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 chair, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So there's there, there's no no correspondence left. Uh, Item nine, and I know that there are two important issues here on any urgent and relevant business. The first of which is the throw over from last night's meeting. And this was a question mark about the two or three representatives. 
So if we could quickly have an answer on that, please, Chief yes. Executive. Thank you, Chair. We were asked to identify the or confirm the DeHaunt allocations uh, for the representation on the Sleeve Bay steering group. Uh, just to confirm, we would be at position 45 on DeHaunt, so position 45 would fall to Sinn Féin and position 46 would fall to the SDLP. And we have two nominations to make, Chair. So that is from? That would be from uh, position 45 and 46 of DeHaunt for the Sleeve Bay uh, steering group, so that would have a particular relevance for the Earn East DEA. So it's Sinn Féin and the SDLP. SDLP. Okay, a nominee and an officer from uh, Sinn Féin. Do you wish to make a proposal? Uh, Gorham Agant, heard, yes, it's, it's similar to last night. The big proposal is that uh, uh, Collier Seamus Green would take up the position. Okay, thank you. A seconder? I'll second Anthony. Thanks for feeling it. Okay. Uh, uh, SDLP, Councillor Garrity. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, propose Councillor Garvin McPhillips. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I'll take a seconder for that, please. Uh, Councillor Coyle here. I'll second the Chair. Thank you. Councillor Coyle. So that is the two representatives, uh, as was discussed last night. Okay. Thank you. The second item of any urgent and relevant business was a Councillor Armstrong. And this was also referred to earlier on by Councillor Green. So, Councillor Armstrong, very quickly, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I know we're pushed for time. It concerns the disruption of the school bus service um, in Tempo. It affects two primary schools in Tempo and seven schools, feeder schools in Enniskillen. Um, this is feeder service to those schools. Um, I, I'd like to propose that the council make urgent representations to the Minister for Education about this um, service because this has been ongoing since the 1st of September. I've been contacted by constituents and the method of communication from um, EANI is, is nothing short of disgraceful because it's being posted on Twitter and alert what is happening the next day. This is going to parents the night before. And because of the refreshing of news feeds that doesn't happen on Twitter, parents are having to scroll to look for this information. I think um, EANI, um, we need them to, to look at a better means of communicating with parents, but the um, the disruption needs to be um, needs to be sorted out straight away. And I think uh, representation on behalf of all their North councillors to, to resolve this situation is urgent. So I propose we do write to the Minister for Education. I also propose that we um, urgently contact EANI. Uh, we want to know what is the reason for these uh, for this disruption. Uh, propose also that they communicate with schools and forward on information through the parents' WhatsApp groups when these, this occurs. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Green. Councillor Green. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I would second that. And just to add that um, I have been, uh, wrote to the minister about two years ago, pointing this out. This is nothing to do with COVID. This is a um, uh, lack of forward thinking within the department. Uh, I'd say a good third of our drivers in uh, uh, transport are in their late 60s or 70s. No provision was made for uh, when uh, these people were retiring or that. Uh, all right, COVID might have uh, brought the, the problem slightly forward, but it was always common. And that's what's wrong at the minute. They have no drivers to replace them, and it's a problem all over. And this will continue to happen in one area or another, not just Air North or Air East. It will continue to happen right across the district. Uh, in the common uh, winter, if some drastic um, measures aren't taken to recruit drivers, this is this this is an ongoing problem, and COVID has brought it forward. So I would support that, and I'd just like to emphasise that we do uh, point out that this has been lack of forward planning, and uh, the amount of uh, the amount of runs that has now been passed over to private contractors almost seems as if the department is trying to uh, privatise uh, bus, uh, school bus transport by stealth. Okay, thank you. There's a lot of speakers want to come in this. I don't have the time to go through them all. And in fact, I'm not going to start. Uh, it was something by Councillor Armstrong so mentioned by uh, Councillor Green. So I'm asking you to take your hands down because of time constraints on the chair. Uh, is there anybody to sense from the recommendation 
uh, which was proposed and seconded. Can I just request the proposer if she'd accept uh, an amend a slight, not amendment, but a no, way I'm, so yeah. I'm sorry, it's any other business and we've, we've dealt with it. I'm under time constraint here. Uh, is there anybody dissents from that general consensus? Okay, thank you, passed. Thank you, Chair. Can we just recess just a minute, please? Okay, members, uh, we're going to move into confidential business now. Uh, can I have a proposer and a seconder? Proposed oh, Councillor Irvine. Thank you. Councillor Councillor Thompson. So we come back and put the recording back on, please. Is the recording back on? Okay, can I have a, an update on what yeah. happened in confidential, please? Thank you, Chair. Just to advise that while in committee, uh, members considered the matters arising from the confidential meeting of the previous, sorry, the confidential minutes of the previous meeting held on the 8th of July, and there were no matters arising. The Council also considered a report on the confidential actions progressed under delegated authority in the period from the 8th of May to 26th of August 2021 inclusive and approved the recommendations and also considered a report uh, on confidential staff matters and noted the report and recommendations and the chair ruled that a confidential legal report would be considered uh, for information at the next policy and resources committee meeting. Proposed chair. Proposed by Councillor Dean, seconded by Councillor Coyle. Seconded, Chair Thompson. Councillor Coyle had his hand up there before you mentioned there, so <laughs> quite happy there. I, I think that's the end of the meeting. I thank everybody for their cooperation. There was a very, very big agenda and very important topics tonight. So I thank you all for your cooperation. And uh, it's not a speedy safe ho home, but it's a safety to you as all for the next period of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, all the best. Thank you. Very